What's up everyone, James here, back at you with another video. I just got home from the gym. I know it's been a while, but I promise you, content has come to the channel. This is just the beginning of it. So today's video is the full story of IDW's Transformers Beast Wars reboot that they did. Uh, I think I finished uh, covering this series the beginning of this year or the end of last year, I can't remember. But this is the full story of it. I think I started covering the series uh, the first year I started this channel. But you're going to see as you go through this entire story how my coverage of these uh, stories changed and even how my editing style changed throughout the couple years I've been doing this. So I really hope you enjoy it. And when you get to the end, please make sure to hit that like button, comment below your thoughts and subscribe to the channel if you want more Transformers content or if you want anything else on this channel, comment below what you would like to see. Other than that, have an awesome day and always remember every day to go beyond. See you later. Now for a lesson. You may have heard these words before, but I'll teach you what they really mean. Go beyond. Plus. Hey, what's up my fellow Beyonders? Sir James here coming at you with another video from Go Beyond Comics. Today, my friends, I'm going to be covering the ongoing Transformers Beast Wars series. Shout out to King of the Beast Wars who recommended I cover this series. I was honestly unsure if I should cover it, but he told me it was worth it. So again, shout out to King of the Beast Wars. Now, the creative team behind this series is writer and cartoonist Eric Burnham who previously wrote the miniseries Transformers and Ghostbusters, which honestly is a crossover I never even thought of, but sounds like fun. The artist is Josh Burkham, who is known for the series Last Stand of the Wreckers and More Than Meets the Eye. I know a couple of you guys have told me I should cover Last Stand of the Wreckers, which I definitely will do at some point because that story sounds amazing. So usually when I cover a comic series, I do one issue at a time, but with this series, I thought, let's do something different. Let's cover multiple issues. Even though it was gonna take me longer, I said, let's just do it. So the plan was just to cover the first three issues of this series. And it quickly went from me just covering the first three issues to me covering the entire Savage Landing arc. So this will be the longest video I've ever done. But before we get started, please hit that like button. And if you're new to the channel, subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. We are so close to a thousand subscribers. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. It would be awesome if we can get there. Now with all that out of the way, let's not waste any more time and get right into this story. So part one of Savage Landing opens on Cybertron with the Tripredicus Council, whose members are C-Clamp, Ramhorn, and Cicadacon, who are all Predacons. Now if you're not aware who these bots are, they're the ruling body of the Predacons on Cybertron. We see them receiving a transmission from the Predacon Galavar, who explains his plan to steal a rumored golden disc that contains valuable information from the Maximal Science Ministry. As Galavar is telling them his plan, he is already enacting. He has his soldiers Scorponok, Dinobot, and Pterosaur break into the Ministry's main hall and take out the Maximal Security Guards. And can I just say, dude, I love seeing Dinobot here. He was one of my favorite characters back on the Beast Wars show. He gets into a confrontation here with Pterosaur because he goes to kill the security guard that's begging for his life, but Dinobot feels that there's no honor in killing a defenseless foe. To just stun the security guard already and be done with it. Scorponok ends it just by killing the guard himself. At the same time, another group of Predacons break into the great shipyard in Voss and destroy almost every transwarp capable Starcraft before stealing the Maximal Warship dark side so really galvar's goal here is to buy himself enough time to flee into deep space travel through time and decode whatever secrets that the golden disc may possess before the maximals can mount a coordinated response the tripredicus council thinks galvar's plan is a bold one but believe it's doomed to fail and tell him that they don't permit him to enact it however galvar tells the council they misunderstand. He wasn't asking for permission. He's already done it. When Ramhorn yells his name back at him in frustration, Galavar replies that isn't his name anymore. 
he has evolved. From now on, he will only answer to his new name, like his namesake, Megatron. He tells the council that like his ancestor Megatron, he will lead the Predacons to glory, and when he meets the council again, they will kneel before him. Ramhorn becomes furious at Megatron's bold power play here, but his fellow council members advise patience that Galavar's rebellion could serve their cause, that he could never play the long game and truly lead the Predacons, that they'll outmaneuver him and be prepared to take advantage of his success or his failure. Meanwhile, aboard the starship Axelon, we see Rhinox delivering a status report to my favorite Transformer of all time, Optimus Primal. Well, I'm just going to address as Primal or Optimus for the rest of this video. Both of them are sparring in the ship's gym, and one thing I felt as I was reading this conversation between Rhinox and Primal is this feels like a young Optimus Primal, which is a nice change up from the Optimus Primal on the show Beast Wars. I might be misremembering, but wasn't he on the show an already established veteran and leader of the Maximals? I really might be misremembering, but let me know in the comments down below. What we learn here is despite his promotion to captain, Primal is yearning for some real action and adventure. He feels that their current mission delivering the, these protoform science experiments is boring and starts to wonder what would happen if they used the Axelon's transwarp drive to explore time and space because the universe is full of mystery. However, Rhinox reminds him the transwarp usage is strictly regulated because the dangers of contaminating a time stream are considerable. And Maximal Command hates that type of thing. So this is why Optimus believes Maximal Command deliberately posted him to this mission to get him to fall in line and to learn his place. But Primal says he hates falling in line. Primal and Rhinox get contacted by Ninx on the bridge. She informs them that they're receiving a message from Cybertron. And one thing that's funny here is Rattrap is talking smack behind Optimus's back, saying his highness is coming to the bridge. But he doesn't realize Optimus heard that over the channel that it's still open. And I don't remember if Rattrap had this little beef with Primal on the show, but it's funny. On the ship's bridge, the crew receives word of the Predacon's attack from Ironhide here. And I don't know what it is, but Ironhide's form in this reminds me of X-Men's Nimrod. Ironhide lets them know about the Predacons attacking the Ministry, stealing this artifact that has sensitive information, destroying most of the transwarp capable ships, and stealing a transwarp capable warship. And really the big fear Maximal Command has is the ripple effect the Predacons can cause from directly meddling with the time stream. Optimus quickly deduces that Ironhide is contacting them because Maximal Command has no other options. Ironhide wishes them luck and transmit the Predacon's warship trajectory. Now we learn from Rattrap's discussion with Cheetor here, the reason why the Predacons haven't used the transwarp drive on their ship yet is that since they stole the warship, they don't have the access codes and need time to crack them. That's why they're coming to the back end of the universe. As everyone is at their stations getting ready to encounter the warship Darkseid, one thing I noticed here is that Ninx has the new Maximal Insignia which looked better in my opinion than the original. Also, I should mention this, she's a new character that wasn't on the original Beast Wars show. And this is cool because on the show, you didn't get another female Transformer until Black Arachnia showed up. When the Dark Side ship arrives, Primal orders Nynx to intercept and for Cheetor to fire when he has a clear shot. Rhinox suggests to try talking to them first, but Primal replies he normally would agree with that course of action but with them being so outgunned, he thinks it's better to take out the thrusters to hobble them first. On the dark side, Skull informs Megatron of the Axelon targeting their thrusters, and Megatron orders to activate the countermeasures for Scorponok to destroy them. The Axelon outmaneuvers their attacks, but since the dark side is jamming their targeting sensors, Cheetor can't safely take out the engines, but fires back anyways, hoping to get a lucky shot. As this was all happening, Tarantulus unlocks the transwarp drive and Megatron sends him the coordinates from the golden disc, and when Tarantulus sees the coordinates, he mentions how they seem familiar. On the Axelon, Rhinox informs Primal the Predacons are firing up their transwarp drive, and Primal replies to lock on their signal, but Rhinox says it's a risky maneuver. Without the precise mid-flight adjustments, they can be torn apart, but Nynx chimes in saying she can make the adjustment. The dark side enters transwarp space, and the Axelon gets dragged along with it. And Megatron is actually impressed by the Maximals achieving such a maneuver. Pterosaur here tries firing on the Axelon while they're in transwarp space, but Dinobot stops him saying he'll accidentally destroy both ships in the process. 
However, then the Predacons come out of the trans warp. Megatron mentions how they have seconds before the Axelon comes out as well and tells Pterosaur to fire as much as he would like. Seconds later, the Axelon arrives and is immediately blindsided by the Dark Side. Primal tells Cheetor to fire back, but Cheetor replies that the weapons are being unresponsive. But Nynx comes up with a plan, and her plan is one interesting one. She rams the Axelon into the Dark Side, pushing it towards the planet. And as both ships tangle together, falling into this planet's atmosphere, Nynx tells Optimus she can get them untangled, but they're still gonna crash. Rhinox overhearing this says the crash would destroy the protoform pods they carry. With no other choice, he releases them into orbit so they could be safe, with the hope that they'll make it to the surface one day. Both ships crash and both crews end up getting knocked unconscious and severely damaged. The AI of both ships reboot and begin to repair the bots, but is alerted of the toxic levels of the Energon radiation. So they scan for compatible options which are living creatures that reside on the planet and fossilized remains. Once repaired and fully rebooted, the Maximals see their beast modes. And Optimus asks the ship's AI why the change was necessary and learns that prolonged exposure to raw energon on this planet will lead to a stasis lock and death without proper protection. At the crash site of the dark side, Tarantulas asks Megatron why they come here of all places. And Megatron explains the Maximals extracted the location of this energon rich planet from the disc before he stole it. Now that that's been proven true, whatever else hidden on the disc must be true as well. That with the raw energon on this planet at their disposal, the Predacons would have enough power to overthrow Maximal Command. But before that can happen, he must take out the crew of the Axelon, thinking they must have survived as well. He says a new war has begun, and this time it's the Predacons who will win. Part 1 ends with the beginning of the Beast Wars. Part 2 opens on the Axelon. Rhinox is looking over all the data on this planet that was obtained from the ship's scanners. And everything about this planet just doesn't make sense to him. You have biomes like the desert and an arctic tundra coexisting side by side. You have mountains floating in the sky and the huge matter of raw energon that resides on this planet. Rhinox gets angry with Ratchap here because he's eating this random fruit, saying bots don't eat organic matter, only energon. However, Ratchap points out that it's much faster to eat the organic matter because their new bodies metabolize it and is a much better option than trying to instead process the local energon into something usable since that takes forever. And as this is going on, they're being watched by the trio of Vop. Now, the Vok are these energy-based alien beings who are behind the creation of this weird prehistoric Earth. They have their designs on this planet and their own experiments, and they were actually a part of the original Beast Wars show. They were these like floating skeleton heads, and there were two of them instead of a trio. At one point on the show, they even posed as Unicron when meeting with Optimus Primal, and they also created one of the most unique looking of the Beast Wars Transformers, Tiger Hawk who I hope makes an appearance in this series. If any of you guys know more about them, please let me know in the comments down below. They inspect Rhinox's memories and discover the Maximals aren't the only ones who arrived on their planet, but the Predacons as well. They teleport into the dark side. And please forgive me if I butcher these names, but Bacock finds both groups intriguing, and Tunra is worried they will contaminate their pristine data that to make sure it stays that way suggests eradicating both groups. And the debate comes down to Takani, who believes they're both right and offers a compromise here. That for the time being, they monitor both factions. But if their disruptions prove to be too severe, they will just raise the planet and start all over again. They end up teleporting away. Scorponok goes to see Megatron, who's been trying to decode the secrets hidden within the golden disc, but just keeps failing. And Scorponok suggests to him that he could try and Megatron just grips him by the throat. And Scorponok reminds him that Megatron said that they were going to attack the Maximals, but he's just been focusing on the disc that his fellow Predacons are growing restless. Megatron then throws him across the room. Now what Megatron says next shows to me he may be just as intelligent as his ancestor. He tells Scorponok they won't attack until they are sure of their defenses and can't be sure of them until Tarantulas finishes surveying the area. Meanwhile, at the Axelon, Optimus Primal checks in with Nyx as she works on repairing the ship. Nyx says Cheetor and her successfully boosted the ship's scanners to get a better look at the area around them. 
and Optimus suggests taking a break and testing out her new wings, her new beast mode. Though she's reluctant at first, Prime tells her it's important to know the lay of the land, and he prefers a first-hand reconnaissance. Nynx, happy at the opportunity, transforms into her beast form and flies off. Back at the dark side, we see Dinobot speaking to Tarantulas, trying to find out the progress in mapping the surrounding area, since Megatron is too focused on decoding the disc. Now he discovers that Tarantulas has stopped mapping the planet and shifted his focus on these curious readings that Scold came across when she was calibrating some sensors. She mistakenly scanned the ship first and found these unspace readings all over. Scold here, I should mention, is also a new character that like Nynx wasn't a part of the original Beast Wars show. Now I should mention this, Eric Burnham said in a Q&A that's at the end of issue one that he has a longer term arc in mind for her and it's one of his favorites. So I'm excited to see her character growth as the series progresses. Tarantulas says to Dinobot that either there was pollution from activating the transwarp drive or something else may have happened. Either way, wouldn't you want to know what it is? And Dinobot replies no and orders Tarantulas to shift his priority back to mapping out the planet and continue his research on his own time. Tarantulas snaps at Dinobot, telling him he has no authority over him. And when Dinobot replies he has no respect for the chain of command, Tarantulas reminds him that there is no chain of command. They're all rogue agents who follow Megatron so long as their interests continue to align. Now, this is really interesting here. Part two is showing us so far that both groups, the Maximals and Predacons, what they have in common is that both aren't really united. The members are not even familiar with each other yet. You have Primal who just recently was given command of the Maximals aboard the Axelon and Megatron who most likely recently formed this group of Predacons here and together just achieved their first mission. Now what I'm going to say is really more directed towards Megatron. If you guys saw my origin of Megatron videos, which if you haven't, here's a link right here. But the original Megatron built up a reputation as someone who rebelled against the Autobots. He went from being a miner to a survivor of a massacre to a prisoner to then becoming the most powerful undefeated gladiator of Kaon before even forming the Decepticons. So that undying loyalty, that inspiration of you can become more than you are no matter your station and fear of what Megatron can do to you was already there before he even made his power play. And that's what Galavar should have said the new Megatron is really missing when it comes to the Predacons. So it would, won't be really surprising if we find out at some point that some of the members of the Predacons have their own agendas. We go to Nynx as she's taking in the sights of this new world in her beast mode. She tries to contact the Axelon but discovers that she's out of range. And out of nowhere, Pterosaur appears. He chases Nynx as she's trying to escape. And she's able to escape the clutch of his beak like a couple times here. And he then transforms into his bot form. And as he's falling, he just opens fire on Nynx. And one of his many shots eventually hits Nynx and knocks her unconscious. Pterosaur transforms back into his beast mode and catches her body. Later, we see Megatron still failing to decrypt the disc. He gets pissed when he's interrupted again until he sees it's Pterosaur who has brought Inks to him. Part 2 ends with Inks becoming the Predacon's prisoner. Part 3 opens later that night. We go to Inks in the Predacon's torture chamber. Megatron, who's leading the interrogation, tells Inks that she'll answer all of his questions about the Maximals or he'll turn her over to Tarantulas who will have her experience pain she's never felt before. She replies that Tarantulas is a butcher, so it's safe to assume the mad scientist most likely has a reputation on Cybertron where he's known for maybe experimenting and killing other bots. Maybe he has a Dr. Frankenstein mixed with a little bit of a Hannibal Lecter reputation. That would actually be pretty cool and crazy and unique if that was the case. Tarantulas toys with Nynx saying no matter what she will feel pain but how much determines her answers. We see Dinobot doesn't like this course of action. When Tarantulas asks him if he's gonna watch he replies he'll wait outside. And as he's waiting outside he hears the sound of Nynx's screams. Meanwhile on the Axelon Cheetor starts to worry that Nynx still hasn't returned from her scouting mission. And Primal suggests that she was so excited to explore maybe she probably lost track of time. And I'm going to be honest, I think it's dumb or I should say naive that Optimus is just assuming that's the case because they're on a world they know nothing about. And that's the point Cheetor makes here. 
saying not only that, but also there can be any number of threats on this world besides the Predacons. However, Prime doesn't want to risk sending one else out in the unknown, especially after nightfall. He suggests waiting until morning and asks Cheetor to try and establish a link with the protoform pods that are in orbit so they can expand their sensor range to planet-wide. And Cheetor reluctantly agrees. Now this conversation we see between Optimus and Rhinox is even more evidence to me that this is a young Optimus Primal who's kind of even also maybe new to command. Rhinox points out that he sounded chipper earlier and has gotten that adventure he craved. They're shipwrecked on an unfamiliar planet with a crew member in need of rescue. Primal asks Rhinox if he thinks he made the right call earlier and Rhinox replies he was right to hold off until morning, that maybe Nynx got lost and hopefully hunkered down for the night. But if he is going to be honest, doesn't really know if that's what happened to her. Back on the dark side, the Predacons continue to torture Nynx. Megatron offers her another chance to give up what she knows, that if she doesn't, eventually the torturing she's enduring will leave irreversible damage. And Nyx replies, history barely remembers the original Me Megatron, and that no one will remember him either. Megatron gets so angry, and he really loses his cool here, he increases the power of the torture device to the highest setting. Nyx's screams cause Dinobot to enter the room and step between Megatron and the device controls pointing out that they can't acquire any useful information from a dead prisoner. Megatron is so furious that Dinobot stopped him that he grabs Dinobot by the throat, viewing his actions as insubordination. And Dinobot replies, saying a worthy enemy deserves a respectful death. I love that Dinobot has a warrior code. He's reminding me of like Zoro from One Piece. Tarantulas interrupts their confrontation, telling Megatron he was able to deduce that nobody would withstand all this punishment and still stay silent unless they had comrades to protect. Megatron agrees and rewards Tarantulas by allowing him to use Nynx for his experiments. And Tarantulas is happy about this and ex is excited at the opportunity of trying out a prototype he's been dying to try. Megatron releases Dinobot and says to him he understands the logic behind his little outburst and since he's a kind and generous leader, he forgives him but to never defy him again. When I first saw this, you guys, I was like, all right, Dinobot's affection to the Maximals is definitely coming soon. Later, Nynx wakes up just outside the dark side, initially thinking she was waking up from a bad dream until she hears Megatron's voice say it was no dream. Nynx tries to transform and fly off, but ends up falling and reversing back to her bot form. Her onboard computer warns her that the Energon poisoning is underway, that she must transform to her beast mode. This is when Tarantulas reveals to Nynx that his prototype, the Transformation Lock Lens, which actually originated on the show, is keeping her from transforming to her beast mode. He even reveals to her what he's going to do to her body after she goes dark, which is consume her body parts in an Energon bath. So my guess of his reputation being Frankenstein mixed with Hannibal Lecter seems like it wasn't too far off. Nynx tries to use her weapons in order to destroy the Lock Lens, but discovers her weapon system has been disconnected. She realizes her only option is to run, and as she tries to run away, the Predacons toy with her by taking shots. When Pterosaur tells Dinobot to get in on the fuck before the Energon poisoning kills her, Dinobot takes a shot, but not at Nynx. He blasts the transformation lock lens into pieces. Megatron orders the Predacons to kill him, but Dinobot proves here he is nobody to mess with. He first takes out Tarantulas, dodges a blast from Scorponok, insults the Predacons by saying blind loyalty is for the simple-minded. He takes out Scorponok by throwing Pterosaur at him, while saying he'll kill any enemy he faces in battle, and he lives to fight. And then he elbows Waspinator in the face. However, Skull gets a clean shot on Dinobot, and then transforms into her beast mode. And Dinobot tries to convince Skull that she can change and be better than the rest of the Predacons. And she replies that she doesn't abandon others, that the Predacons never did that to her. But Dinobot replies, of course they didn't. They don't abandon those useful to them. And Skull gets pissed at his words and says to stop talking to her and says that he's nothing but a traitor. Megatron confronts Dinobot, saying that he knew they were going to use guerrilla tactics instead of taking on Maximal Command head on, and he still joined them. That he thought him strong and worthy, but he was wrong. That this was probably bound to happen. All brilliant leaders are tested. And Dinobot's reply here is so good. He lays the verbal smackdown on Megatron. 
when he says if strength is all it took to be a leader then scold would be in charge and as far as brilliant your plans are half thought out at best you don't know how to use or inspire your followers you even lost your maximal hostage you'll have to start thinking things through when i read this i was like damn dinobot just roasted megatron he then hurls Skull's body at Megatron, knocking him back into the ship. Dinobot speaks this code that forces the Dark Side ship into lockdown and ends up trapping all the Predacons inside. Part 3 ends with Megatron admitting that Dinobot's treachery, his execution was flawless, but promises his fellow Predacons that when he gets his hands on Dinobot, they'll witness another flawless execution. Part 4 opens with Nynx after being saved by Dinobot and escaping the Predacons. She's taking shelter inside this tree in the forest, and Nyx realizes she's badly injured, she can't contact the Maximals, and when she says her only option is to fly to the Axelon, her onboard computer tells her that's not an option either. And Nyx decides to ignore it because making it into the Axelon and into a cryogenic restoration chamber without flying would take a miracle. When flying fails, despite the computer warning her against it, she decides to take her chances by transforming into her bot form so she can walk home. She doesn't get far, however, before this huge, saber-toothed, spiky-looking tiger comes leaping out of the bushes to attack her. Nynx tries to use her weapons, but finds them still offline. She manages to backroll and kick this predator in its underbelly as it pounces towards her, but it quickly gets on its feet again. She then grabs a branch to use as a club and gives this beast a nice swing to the face. Unfortunately though, this beast is one tough cookie. It shrugs off her blow like it was nothing. The beast destroys her club, and it leaps toward Nynx to deliver a killing blow, but is stopped by Dinobot, who literally grabs this predator like it's nothing, and then tosses it. And I love Dinobot. Initially, Nynx warns Dinobot to stay back, and says she's not going back to their ship. However, she's surprised when Dinobot replies, he has no intention of going back either, and when she finds out he's the one who helped her. Nynx ends up succumbing to her injuries and the Energon poisoning, and Dinobot tries to get Nynx's status from her onboard computer, but the computer refuses to give him a detailed analysis. Dinobot ends up putting Nynx onto his back, and he's able to get Nynx's onboard computer to let him access her internal movement logs so he can reach the Axelon. Later at the Axelon, Rhinox and Cheetor are working on the Axelon sensor range by manually rewiring the ship systems. As they work their way through the ship's computer, Cheetor discovers something really suspicious here. Someone aboard their ship logged a message to the Predacon Technolab just before they left Cybertron. Rhinox points out though that the Maximals and Predacons have always shared information because of the Pax Cybertronia mandates it. And if you're not aware what the Pax Cybertronia is, it's the binding peace accord that's responsible for ending the great war between the Autobots and the Decepticons. And Cheetor is like, okay, even though that's the case, if all of if it is above board, then why delete the message? And Ronax assures him that there is no skullduggery, as he puts it. But this is kind of crazy that we have a possible spy amongst the Maximals. I'm going to guess it's probably Rat Trap or Nyx. Those are my guesses. Let me know in the comments down below who do you guys think it is. And if it's already been revealed in the series, please no spoilers if you know already. Rat Trap enters the room, having scavenged this item he's carrying from Nyx's room. And just as he plugs it in and turns it on, a ping from the bridge catches the crew's attention. An Optimus Primal appears, telling them he turned a data collection shell into an improvised radar dish to strengthen their connection to the orbital protoform network, which makes it easier for them to cut through the Energon interference. And after that, he programmed it to find Nynx's personal comm frequency. I like that Eric Burnham is showing that Optimus is very intelligent and he's more than just a soldier. As they look on the hollow map, they see Nyx's signal and notice it's moving slowly. And Primal begins to think something may be wrong and gets mad at himself for not going sooner to find Nyx. Meanwhile, on the dark side, the Predacons are still locked on the ship. And we see Tarantulus is working on unlocking the ship and is pissed that Dinobot got the upper hand on him, saying he refuses to be outsmarted by a grunt when he's the greatest genius Cybertron has ever seen, which I doubt is true. Eventually, Tarantulas unlocks the ship, and Megatron orders the Predacons to hunt. He tells them that their primary target is Dinobot, secondary is Nynx. 
He tells them they don't come back until they've tasted victory and vengeance. He orders Pterosaur and Waspinator to take the sky. He orders Scorponok to follow Dinobot's trail. And when Scorponok says that Dinobot is just as good at covering his trail as he is at following them, Megatron replies, well, you can find excuses, so pretend Dinobot is one of those. I was just like, damn, Megatron is a jerk. He tells Tarantulas and Scold here that they're with him, that if Dinobot is foolish enough to be waiting for them, he'll be met with greater numbers. Now, the funny thing here is, is Scold kind of says under her breath that Dinobot fought them all before, which is true, and he beat the brakes off of all of them. I guess Megatron forgot about that. Now, what Megatron does next is kind of crazy here. In order to ensure no one else betrays him, he activates a self-destruct sequence that will activate if anyone goes on board the ship that isn't him. At the Axelon, Optimus and the Maximals are on the lookout for any signs of Nynx. Finally, they catch sight of Dinobob with Nynx on his back. Now, Optimus assumes that Dinobob must have kidnapped her, and he leads the Maximals into action. But they pause for a moment when Dinobot introduces himself and explains what happened to Nynx and her current condition. However, Cheatsword doesn't care to hear him out and goes on the attack. But Dinobot, with no problem, grabs Cheatsword by the throat and throws him to the ground. He pulls out Psycarbon Blade, which looks so awesome, and threatens to end Cheatsword's life in order to get the Maximals' full attention. Dinobot makes the Maximals aware of the war that's coming and how he wishes to fight alongside those who are honorable. That Nynx proved to be honorable and hopes the other Maximals are as well, but would like to find out. Part 4 ends with Dinobot formally requesting to become a Maximal. Part 5 opens inside the Axelon. Dinobot is being detained in a holding cell, and we see Optimus Primal is interrogating him, trying to find out why he really is here. He doesn't believe Dinobot's change of heart, and suspects him to be a Trojan horse. Dinobot tells Optimus he wishes to fight at the maximal side, and that's really it. It's really that simple. But then, with a smirk on his face, just casually asks Optimus, would he prefer if he challenged him for command? He even says, we can still battle to your death in front of the others. And Optimus with a smirk on his face as well, asks, what makes you think I wouldn't be the winner? And I really, really like this back and forth between Optimus and Dinobot. But now, here's my question to you guys. One on one. In a knockdown, drag out fight, who wins? Let me know in the comments down below. Before Dinobot can answer Optimus, Nynx enters the room, fully repaired from her injuries. She asks Optimus if she can speak to Dinobot alone, and Optimus allows it, and he starts to say something else but stops himself, and then just exits the room. Now this conversation you guys are about to witness between Dinobot and Nynx is amazing. Dinobot accurately deduces that Optimus is new to command, because Optimus let Nynx go off on her own without fully considering all the possible consequences that maybe he should have challenged Optimus. Nynx tells Dinobot she isn't here to talk about Optimus. She's here to ask Dinobot why did he help her. And when Dinobot replies that it's because she didn't deserve to die being tortured, Nynx replies, why do you care? And makes a really good po point here saying that she knows that there has been peace for a long time between the Maximals and Predacons, but that animosity, that hatred doesn't just go away. It runs deep within the spark. And when Dinobot tries to joke with her, she snaps at him, saying he doesn't get to joke with her because he's a terrorist who attacked the science ministry, the shipyards, the Axelon, and then tortured her. And Dinobot slowly rises to his feet and says to Nynx that he did not torture her. He then asks Nynx a very interesting question here. What does she know about the Predacon? Without any prejudice, hearsay, but what she knows for certain from her own experiences. And that is a very, very good question. I love this because he's basically saying, don't judge me based on other people's opinions or what you've heard. Judge me based on your own experiences with me and my people. And Nyx replies, what she knows for certain is that the Predacons are aggressive and violent. And Dinobot tells her, well, it's because we come from a warrior caste and further explains that they were meant to be warriors. That's who they are. But there's not always a war to fight, so they had to learn to be content and thrive in any conflict they found themselves in, whether it be in athletics or law. 
that some Predacons even joined the sciences to fight accepted knowledge, and the rest served as peacekeepers. That he believes in honor, and Megatron said he did too, that's how he recruited Dinobot to his cause. And Megatron argued that the Maxwell's attempt to cover up the importance of the Golden Disk was a disgrace. And Dinobot agreed with that and says he still does. But when he saw how the Predacons, especially how Megatron acted, once they got the disc, he didn't like it. And Ninx being tortured was his breaking point. However, he makes it clear that if he and Ninx battled, he would have killed her without hesitation. But instead, he saw someone refusing to give up despite being tortured, and he respected that. And tells her that's the reason why he helped her. We then see Rat Trap here watching the conversation between Dinobot and Ninx from the bridge, and Cheetor catches him doing this. All of a sudden though, Rat Trap notices an alarm going off. Just outside the Axelon, Megatron and the other Predacons have successfully tracked Dinobot and Ninx to the ship. When Pterosaur suggests to Megatron the idea to attack the Axelon from a distance, this is where we see even more arrogance from Megatron. He's kind of being overconfident. He ignores Pterosaur's suggestion because he thinks that the outnumbered Maximals and the ship being heavily damaged will be no match for them. On the Axelon, the Maximals watch as the Predacons are closing in, and Optimus orders Rat Trap to raise the defenses, but Rat Trap gives him some bad news, that all the time they spent searching for Ninx distracted them from running repairs. Optimus, with not much of a choice, orders Rat Trap to do what he can to get the defenses up while he, Cheetor, and Rhinox buy him time. As the Maximals are approaching the Predacons, Megatron is able to deduce that they have no force shields to hide behind. He orders Tarantulas to sneak into the ship and to find a way to destroy it from within. Megatron really, his cockiness and arrogance knows no bounds. He introduces himself to the Maximals as the future ruler of Cybertron and gives them an ultimatum. Lay down and swear an oath of loyalty or face destruction. Optimus counters back by introducing himself and offering them an opportunity to surrender. Megatron says he'll live to regret being defiant and orders the Predacons to terrorize. Inside the Axelon, Ninx and Dinobot hear the sounds of the battle outside, and Ninx asks the ship's computer what's going on, and the computer reports that the Axelon is under Predacon attack. And Dinobot asks Ninx to release him, and she's hesitant at first, even though he saved her life. But Dinobot points out that the Maximals are outnumbered, and will be overtaken without his help. We go to the battle outside, and we see Cheetor going up against Scorponok and Waspinator. And he's kind of pulling a flash here, which is pretty cool. He's moving so fast that they both can't get a hit on him. We see Rat Trap working on repairing the ship's systems, and while he's doing that, he hears an unusual noise. And when he goes to investigate, he discovers Tarantulas. And as Tarantulas has his fangs closing in on Rat Trap, he says maybe he'll have a snack before destroying the ship. However, Rat Trap manages to grab his arc welder and torches Tarantulas in the face, which gives him the opportunity to run away. Tarantulas transforms into his bot form, shouting at Rat Trap, saying he'll deal with him after he's done with the ship. Outside, as the battle rages on, we finally get what we've been waiting for. Optimus Primal versus Megatron. Though Megatron knocks down Optimus and gets the upper hand in this fight, Optimus says to Megatron, I told a friend I don't like falling, but in this case, it gives me an advantage, and sweeps Megatron's leg. We see Cheetor now dodging attacks from Waspinator and Parasaur. And I have to say, Cheetor's speed is really impressive here. He asks for help, but Optimus is fighting Megatron, and Rhinox is battling Scold. I love this fight here, because Rhinox finds Scold just as strong as he is, and yes, she may be tiny, but she's powerful. She gives Rhinox a sure you can to the jaw. We then go back to Megatron and Optimus's battle, and Megatron gains the upper hand again and tries to deliver a killing blow. However, all of a sudden, a laser blast from a distance hits him, and it's from Dinobot. Part 5 ends with Dinobot appearing on the battlefield alongside Ninx. So now we are at the finale of Savage Landing. If you've made it this far, I greatly appreciate you and I hope you're enjoying this video. Part 6 opens with Rat Trap hiding from Tarantulas as he searches for him. And Tarantulas is goading Rat Trap here, trying to get him to come out of hiding by saying he's gonna destroy the ship if he doesn't stop him, that the Maximals will die if he doesn't stop him. 
Luckily, Rat Trap is too smart to fall for it. Tarantulas ends up giving up when he realizes Rat Trap isn't falling for it. As he's walking through the corridors, his attention is taken by the Maximals Tech Lab and pries it open to enter so he can see what he can plunder. The Mad Scientist's temptation gets the best of him despite his mission. Meanwhile, outside, as the Maximals and Predacons battle, we see Dinobot beating the brakes off a of Waspinator here. He literally tears his arm off and beats him with it. Like how you get beat with your own arm, bro? As this battle is going on, Pterosaur, watching from above, is hoping since Dinobot joined the battle, the Maximals will gain the upper hand and Megatron will be hobbled or destroyed in the process, making it easier for him to take over the Predacons. But Pterosaur gets a taste of his own medicine when Ninx appears and takes him by surprise and tells Pterosaur we have a score to settle. Which this was so awesome. Back on the ship, Tarantulas hacks into the Maximal computer and accesses the flight log, where he discovers the cargo of protoform pods the Axelon was forced to eject are now in orbit around the planet. And this is where we learn yet another member of the Predacons has their own secret machinations. Tarantula says to himself if he can bring down the pods from orbit down to the surface, he can raise his own army, and Megatron would end up bowing to him. Rattrap, who is watching Tarantula from the ship's air duct systems, overhears his plan. He says to himself though he isn't a fighter, there is something he can find that'll stop Tarantula. Back at the battle, we see Megatron gloating yet again as he is crushing Optimus. Megatron says that if he surrenders now and dies with dignity, he'll memorialize him in the historical records. However, Primal replies with what I was thinking. You talk too much and smashes himself out of Megatron's grip. Megatron ends up charging his cannon and decides that he'll still allow Optimus Primal's name to grace the historical records of his new empire. But as he prepares to fire, Ninx throws Pterosaur into Megatron's blast. As that's going on, Tarantulas is struggling with the maximal security system. Rat Trap, pulling a Ripley from Aliens, is inside a ship's cargo loading exoskeleton, catching Tarantulas by surprise. Like this was so awesome. He ends up tossing him right out the window. This whole scene definitely had to be inspired by Aliens. Anyways, now with Tarantulas gone, Rat Trap is now able to finish repairing the ship's defensive force fields. He tells the ship's onboard AI after he's done to boot up the force fields to their maximum range. As the force fields are activated, the Maximals fall back towards the ship, and Ninx tells Dinobot to fall back with them as the force fields are specifically tied to the source code of the Maximals to prevent the Predacons and their weapons from getting through. Unfortunately though, Ninx forgot Dinobot is a Predacon, so he ends up not being able to go through and is left on the outside as the Predacons encircle him. And Dinobot is confident, which I love, because he says he's taken them all alone before. However, Megatron points out that he was lucky because he had the element of surprise on his side. I love Dinobot's response to that. He says that there are only five of you, I'll make this quick. And what Megatron says you should count again out of nowhere, Tarantulas appears from behind and stabs Dinobot through the chest. When I first saw this, I was like, no! Dinobot drops to the ground and the Predacons start to lay a beat down on him. Ninx shouts that they have to do something and Primal agrees and contacts the Axelon to engage the dual plasma cannons. They end up firing the volley of blasts at the Predacons and Primal tells Megatron to leave before he fires again. And Megatron does so, but not before kicking Dinobot one last time. And as the Predacons retreat, Megatron warns Optimus that he was a fool for not pushing the advantage when he had it. That one day he will pay for that mistake with his life. That Megatron will be victorious. The story then takes us a few days later, we get an epilogue here. Kind of finishing our story with the Maximals the way it started. Optimus and Rhinox holding another sparring match in the gym. And through their conversation, we learn that Megatron's parting words are weighing heavily in Optimus's mind, and it's made him think about his actions as a leader since they landed. That the possibility of the action and adventure he was yearning for clouded his judgment, and nearly got Ninx killed, and him not wanting to trust Dinobot nearly cost them the battle. I love this right here because we're seeing 
Optimus grow. We're seeing him learn from his mistakes. Rhinox reminds him that nobody's perfect and to not second guess himself, especially now with the stakes so high. As they're leaving the gym, Rhinox asked Optimus how's Dinobot doing. Optimus replies he doesn't know, that the damage he sustained was extensive and the ship's restoration chamber can only do so much and he even wonders if he'll spark will fade. But Dinobot answers his question when he enters the room using a walking stick. He tells Optimus he'll live but his injuries were severe and he doesn't know if he'll ever be the same warrior he was. That he's come to say goodbye, he's put going into exile because he believes he won't be an asset to the Maximals. But Optimus stops him and asks him to reconsider. And this is where we get a little bit of history when Optimus reminds Dinobot of the significance of his name and tells him the history of the Dinobots. That they were a great faction of Autobots during the Great War who were savage but courageous and fought bravely until their untimely disappearance. That he sees those same qualities in Dinobot and he then asks Dinobot to reconsider and would be honored if he joined the Maximals. And though Dinobot is hesitant at first, he eventually accepts the offer. The finale ends with Dinobot officially a part of the Maximals. And that is the end of Transformers Beast Wars, the Savage Landing Art. Hey, what's up everyone, James here. And today we are finally back covering in this video, we're gonna cover Pod Landing Arc Part 1 and 2 and Thicker Skin. I know this is long overdue, but now I promise we will catch up on this story. So, Pod Landing Arc Part 1 opens in the Axelon's Gymnasium, where we see Optimus Primal and Dinobot are sparring. I have to say, I do like this change in the artwork. Now, remember, Dinobot is still recovering from the wounds his former Predacon brethren gave him in the last battle. Primal is having a sparring match with Dinobot because this is Primal's way of mixing discussions with exercise. Which which we saw at the beginning of Savage Landing. And I didn't mention this in that last video, but this is the writer Eric Burnham giving a nod to the comic industry on constantly feeling the need to have talking head discussions as he puts it in comics. Now, Primal is checking up on Dinobot and seeing how he's acclimating to the other Maximals. And Dinobot admits to Primal that he's had limited interaction with the other Maximals, but Rat Trap has threatened him. He sees it as progress, even though he could crush Raptrap if he wanted to. And Primal jokes with Dinobot, asking if he's sure about that because he hasn't shown him much in their sparring match. Dinobot becomes enraged at that comment and goes into his beast mode. And the sparring match becomes serious after this. He leaps towards Primal, his jaws bearing down on him as Primal holds him back with his sparring rod. Eventually, Primal's able to knock him back and then he changes into his beast mode as Dinobot slashes him with his claws, asking, are you mocking me? Primal replies with a right hook to the jaw of Dinobot, and this gets Dinobot amped up and he's ready to keep the sparring match going, but his body gives out on him, forcing him to call an end to the sparring match. Dinobot becomes frustrated at his body giving out on him, but Primal assures him the sparring match was fun and that they should do it again. While on their way to the restoration chamber, Primal tries to remind Dinobot of the trauma of his injuries and tells him that he shouldn't take it lightly, but Dinobot replies he doesn't need his concern. As Dinobot is in the restoration chamber, Primal tells him that he won't have to worry about being injured by the Predacons again because they altered the Axelon shield to recognize his spark signature. That the next time they face the Predacons, it'll be on their terms. However, Dinobot warns Primal he shouldn't underestimate his enemies because the Predacons are very good at exploiting an advantage. Meanwhile, at the dark side, Megatron has gone back to decrypting the golden disk. He successfully decrypts a file on the disk that reveals a message. And this is kind of crazy because what Megatron sees in this message is himself on the computer screen. The message plays briefly and then cuts out. The dark side computer informs Megatron the file got corrupted and cannot be retrieved. And Megatron screams in frustration saying, what was that message? Now, if you guys noticed, Megatron had a rubber ducky of some sort in his T-Rex head hand. And it's funny, he, he tosses it to the side when he screams in frustration. Now, unbeknownst to Megatron, the other Predacons are outside his quarters overhearing everything. Pterosaur suggests to the other Predacons that Megatron is losing his mind and they should prepare for a new leader. Scorponok replies that he sounds treasonous and the only thing they should prepare for is an Energon run. That they can't win a war if they're low on fuel. 
Pterosaur replies that they can't win a war either if they don't fight it. They should be attacking the Axelon non-stop. However, Scorponok makes an excellent point here, saying that they would be blasting away at a shield they can't penetrate now and they don't have to worry about the Maximals attacking because he says it's not in their nature. That they should stick to the original plan of gathering Energon and start the only fight that matters in time, the fight for Cybertron. Scorponok suggests in the meantime both of them and Waspinator gather as much Energon as possible, and Scold here asks the tag along mentioning that she can carry more Energon than all three of them combined. Like don't forget you guys, Scold here is the strongest of the Predacons. Scorponok tells her that they need her to stay to defend the ship, since Tarantulus and Megatron are focused on their work. But Skold points out that he said the Maximals wouldn't attack. And Pterosaur interrupts, insulting Skold, saying she can't come because she's too slow, implying that she's slow in every sense of the word. Pterosaur then flies off, laughing at her. As Pterosaur and Waspinator are flying towards one of the floating islands here, Waspinator basically asks Pterosaur why he bullies Skold. And Pterosaur responds, saying he does it to keep Skold from gaining enough confidence that she starts to believe she can lead the Predacons. Since Skold is so strong, she could punch through solid Duranium. And the funny thing here is this is an Easter egg. Duranium is the metallic substance used to construct the ships in Star Trek. So yeah, Skold is so strong that she could punch a hole in the Enterprise. So this is the last thing Pterosaur wants because we all know he secretly covets that position. When Waspinator asks Pterosaur what if he pushes Skull too far, Pterosaur just assumes Skull at this point would probably just cower in fear and not fight back. From there we go to one of the stasis pods in orbit, receiving a transmission that begins to upload a program, but the transmission is lost shortly after. Now if you guys remember back in part 6 of Savage Landing, Tarantulus discovered the stasis pods in orbit and attempted to land them so he could reprogram them into Predacons in order to start his own army that would help him overthrow Megatron. But Rat Trap pulled an aliens and threw him out of the ship before he can complete his own personal mission. The pod begins to descend, and after the pod crash lands on the planet, Black Arachnia emerges confused, asking the onboard computer what planet is she on. And the onboard computer replies that it's undocumented and informs her about the incomplete program update, asking if she wants to complete it. And Black Arachnia applies to continue it as she begins to explore the planet. Planet. And as she's investigating the planet, she feels the Energon radiation levels. Her onboard computer suggests going into her beast mode, but before this can happen, she's dragged into the river by this dragon-like crocodile. She tries to bash it in the head while being in this crocodile's jaws, but it doesn't affect it. The crocodile replies by smashing her into the riverbed. Now we don't see it, but it's safe to assume Black Arachnia uses her fangs to dispose of the crocodile. We then see her coming out of the riverbed unharmed in her beast mode. The onboard computer informs her that there's an active signal from a Cybertronian ship nearby. Back at the Axelon, while the Maximals play a card game, Dinobot informs them of the personality traits, strengths, and weaknesses of each of the Predacons. He says Scorponok is a true believer in the Predacon cause, and will align with any interest that he believes best serve it. Skold is powerful but insecure. Pterosaur is a bully with delusions of glory he'll never achieve. Waspinator isn't bright, but he could never tell if it was all an act or not. Tarantulas is already well known among the Maximal ranks, which we learned a bit about in Savage Landing Part 3. We only know that he's known as a butcher. I still think he's Dr. Frankenstein mixed with Hannibal Lecter, but we have yet to truly know his reputation on Cybertron. Rap Trap cracks a bad tasting joke here about his reputation for backstabbing, which we know that's how he nearly took out Dinobot at the end of Savage Landing. Rhinox is surprised to hear Dinobot's blunt opinions about his former allies. And we learn here, even after everything the Predacons have done, Rhinox is still holding on to this delusion of a peaceful resolution and was hoping Dinobot's opinions would have revealed a path to that. We then go to Black Arachne arriving outside the Axel on shields and she quickly realizes she's able to go through because the defense system doesn't recognize her spark and as she is on the ship about to check in with the maximals the predacon program completes its installation and takes over now as a fully fledged predacon black arachnia realizes that she has been undetected so far and has an excellent opportunity 
to cause real damage to the Maximals. As she sneaks by, Cheetor overhears something, and even though the other Maximals dismiss it as nothing since the shields are still up, Rhinox asks Nynx if she heard anything since she has the most sensitive audio receptors. And Nynx replies she didn't hear anything but mentions that she hears everything, and it's hard for her to filter out anything. Cheetor still abandons the game and goes to investigate. As he investigates, he asks the ship's computer if anyone came on board the last few hours, and when the computer replies negative, Black Arachnia ambushes Cheetor with a kick to the face. Cheetor is fast, so he's able to dodge her following attacks while trying to calm her down, thinking she's just a confused Maximal Explorer who came from one of the pods. After Black Arachnia is able to land a hit that knocks him back, Cheetor decides to change into his beast mode and attack her before she can hurt herself or anyone else. Black Arachnia successfully dodges his attack and paralyzes Cheetor with her Venom Blaster. Cheetor contacts Optimus Prime over the comm system, saying we have a problem, but before he can continue, Black Arachnia shoots him again, knocking him out. And that is the end of Pod Landing Part 1. We then go to Pod Landing Part 2. Aboard the Axelon, Optimus Primal can't reach Cheetor on his comlink system. Primal asks the ship's computer where Cheetor is, and the computer replies he is near the processing bay. The Maximals head to the middle corridor, and they find Cheetor hanging from the ceiling, wrapped in webs that smell like Energon all over his body. After Cheetor is freed, he tells them that a Predacon is on the ship. And Rhinox finds this hard to believe, but Primal reminds him the Maximals within the Protoform pods could enter, but he wonders why would one of them attack. Rattrap informs Primal that Tarantulus was snooping around one of the labs, in the last battle and could have done something to them. Primal then tries to order the ship's computer to search for other maximal energy signatures, but the computer denies the request. He realizes the unknown Predacon has already broken into the system and taken control. He orders the maximals to seal the ship and to split up in order to find this intruder. While Black Arachnia is already ahead of them, we see her watching them from the ship's security cameras as she starts hacking into the Axelon's data files and begins downloading them on her own server. She quickly realizes though, she won't be able to extract all of the ship's files in time and comes up with an even better plan. Her new plan is to upload the Predacon code into all the protoform pods in space turning them into loyal Predacon soldiers. At the same time the Predacon code is being uploaded to the Protoform pods, Rhinox appears, threatening to put Black Arachnia in a holding cell. Black Arachnia replies, you'll be too busy dealing with this, as she activates the landing protocols for all the space pods. Now she may not have been able to infect all of the pods, but she was able to infect over half of them. So this is still a big win for the Predacon cause. Now this is totally different from the original Beast War show. In the show, the Maximals and Predacons had to wait for each stasis pod to descend, and then each faction would race each other there, and whoever was the first one there had the first opportunity to convert that bot into their ranks. Black Arachnia easily outmaneuvers Rhinox and avoids capture. Rhinox then informs Optimus Primal their intruder called the protoform pods out of orbit with no designated landing paths. When Primal asks how, Rhinox replies that he doesn't know but they will lose some pods no matter what he does. Primal, frustrated, tells the Maximals he wants the intruder captured, and Dinobot suggests that the intruder is possibly in the armory since that's something he would do. As the Maximals converge on the armory, suddenly Dinobot tackles Cheetor and Rattrap yelling stop. Rattrap immediately calls him a traitor. However, Dinobot points out a web tripwire attached with three Talvox grenades they were about to trigger. Out of nowhere, an explosion occurs, rocking the Axelon. Rattrap quickly deduces that the intruder made an exit by blowing a hole in the ship. Cheetor, refusing to let Black Arachnia get away that easily, pursues her in his beast mode, quickly catching up and pouncing on her. Black Arachnia kicks him off and fires her Venom Blaster in order to paralyze him again. But Cheetor dodges her attacks, not falling for that trick again, he then wraps his jaws around her blaster. Black Arachnia uses her fangs to stab Cheetor on the side of his face and then uses her fangs to toss him aside. Cheetor changes into his bot form and starts immediately firing his blaster at Black Arachnia, telling her she'll answer for her crimes as Cybertron, the deaths of the protoform pods, and for her attacks against the Maximals. Black Arachnia replies, firing her fang repeating blasters. She's never been to Cybertron and the pods are stronger than he thinks. While the battle is at a standstill, 
Black Arachnia fools Cheetor into thinking she laid another trap for the Maximals. Cheetor, worried that the other Maximals would trigger it, abandons the battle and races back to the Axelon to warn them. Later, the Maximals regroup on the ship's bridge, Rhinox reporting the damage Black Arachnia caused. He says that she was able to download 10% of the ship's memory core and upload the Predacon code into over half of the Protoform pods. When he pulled apart the code, he discovered a forcible overwrite replacing the Maximal values with the aggressive version of the Predacon traits. Now, Rhinox says that there were other instructions there, but he doesn't reveal what they are. After hearing all this, Primal gets pissed and admits this is his fault. Now, I love what he says here. He says, I let myself get cautious after what happened to Nynx. Had us hide behind a shield while we bide our time working on repairs and studying the planet until we could find a way to deal with the Predacons and it's gotten us nowhere. We are changing tactics, focusing on a new plan of attack, and when it's as perfect as we can make it, we are going to hit the Predacons where they live. Dinobot approves of this strategy, but replies, Maximals aren't known for launching preemptive strikes. And Primal just says, things change. Meanwhile, at the dark side, Black Arachnia sneaks onto the ship, and what's funny is we see Waspinator is asleep with a teddy bear in his arms. Black Arachnia sees Tarantulas is trying to contact the pods in space. She sneaks up behind him, reporting that the pods are no longer there. This surprises Tarantulas, and he then attacks Black Arachnia, demanding to know how she got in. When she replies with the access codes he sent her, Tarantulas quickly deduces he successfully contacted at least one of the pods when he was on the Axelon. But when he tells Black Arachnia that she is his slave and to bow before him, Black Arachnia kicks Tarantulas in the stomach, knocking him back, saying that part of the code didn't go through. I'm no one's slave. Though Tarantulas' experiment was partly successful in his eyes, he is pleased that another Predacon has joined their ranks and swears to Black Arachnia that there will be more. Black Arachnia smiles and replies, no need to swear, I bring wonderful news. And that is the end of the pod landing arc. We then go to our final story here, Thicker Skin. Now this story really focuses on Scold and is really damn good. All right, so here it goes. So the story opens at the dark side with Megatron celebrating Tarantulas, rewriting the Protoform pod's maximal code into Predacons, adding more bots to their army. Even though Megatron is happy with the additional forces, he isn't pleased with the fact that Tarantulas kept his hidden from him until Black Arachnia showed up. Megatron announces to the other Predacons that the dozens of new recruits coming to their army will bring the return of the Predacons to their rightful places as the rulers of Cybertron. Tarantulas reminds Megatron though that not all the pods were reconditioned, and the Energon radiation will make it difficult to track the pods. But Megatron doesn't think that it will be a problem. He says, despite the bravado of Optimus Primal, he would never risk one of his own in an attack. Once we acquire our new recruits, will maintain a permanent presence at the Maximal ship, hammering away at their ship's shields until it falls. We will continue our plan of gathering Energon, decrypting the Golden Disk secrets, and repairing our ship. Once we return to Cybertron, the Tripedicus Council will bow, and my empire shall be born. What Pterosaur says next shows why Megatron once again is the brains of this operation. Pterosaur says that he thinks it would have been easier to use the Transwarp Drive to travel back in time and kill the Maximals before ever coming online. And Megatron explains that the last thing they want is to undo their selves in the process. That the past is a delicate foundation. Everything it holds will fall if you remove the wrong piece. He tells Pterosaur that he lacks foresight and one day that it will get him killed. And he orders Pterosaur and Waspinator to go looking for the pods. Pterosaur complains that the planet is too massive. However, Black Arachnia explains that all of the pods have been programmed to land within 500 clicks of the maximal ship. Pterosaur, for some reason, accuses Black Arachnia of treachery and trickery for programming the pods to land so close to the maximal ship. Black Arachnia leaps onto Pterosaur, quickly disarming him, saying she used that location because that's where she was at the time and wouldn't need tricks if she wanted to harm him. Scold, impressed with Black Arachnia, suggests they team up to find the pods betting they can find more than Pterosaur and Waspinator, but Black Arachnia insults her, asking if she's an idiot and saying the flyers will cover more ground. And you can see this hurts Scold's feelings, and it doesn't help that Pterosaur laughs at her 
and tells her that she needs to grow a thicker skin. Scorponok suggests to Scold that she help with maintenance, but Scold replies that she wants to be alone right now. Later, we see Scold out in the wilderness, and she feels her energon running low, and her onboard computer suggests hunting for food in the lake using her beast mode. And while snapping up a fish, she comes across one of the protoform pods at the bottom of the lake. In her bot form, Scold brings the pod out of the lake. And after she sets it down, the bot inside punches the door open. And this bot is revealed to be Razor Beast. He thanks Scold for helping set him free, but suddenly who appears stopping time are the bot. We haven't seen these guys since Savage Landing Part 2. They're observing Scold and Razor Beast, and we learn from their discussion that Pakak is shocked to see how Razor Beast formed a whole personality at birth and seems to already be imprinting on Scold either as a parent or a mentor. Tunra observes that both of them come from opposing factions, thinking maybe they'll kill each other. So this confirms that Razor Beast wasn't affected by the Predacon code. Takani is interested to see if any challenges they would face would have them behave or go against their faction's nature. Pakak likes the idea and arranges a little experiment involving iron wolves. The Vok disappear and then we go back to Razor Beast and Scold meeting each other. Razor Beast asks Scold for an update on the present circumstances because he's confused by the vast amount of energon radiation on this planet and how Scold, a Predacon, ended up on an exploratory mission since they never go on those type of missions. So I found this interesting, but also confusing. Compared to Black Arachnia's Awakening, Razor Beast seems to have been born with a personality and it seems like he's done exploratory missions before when he's supposed to be a newborn bot. If you guys know more, or if I miss something, let me know in the comments down below. But anyways, he asked Scold how she came to be on this mission, and this is where we get Scold's origin, and I like this a lot. Scold explains that she originally wanted to be an artist. She would spend all her time at the sculpture garden in Iacon, admiring all the works of art there, but she eventually gave up because she found something new to focus on. She doesn't tell Razor Beast this, but in her flashback, we see the real reason Scold gave up was because she was constantly bullied and harassed by Maximals at the Sculpture Garden, who made her doubt herself and made her think her race was only good enough for mining or fighting in the gladiatory pits. Which is a nice callback to the original Megatron, who was first a miner, but then became a gladiator. At some point, Galavar approached her, who is now Megatron, and she ended up joining his rebellion. Out of nowhere, a how interrupts Skull's story. Razor Beast and Skull discover that their path is blocked by Iron Wolves. Without hesitation, Razor Beast charges toward the Iron Wolves, changing into his bot form, delivering the first blow. As Skull and Razor Beast are battling the Iron Wolves, Skull tells Razor Beast to escape while she holds them off, but Razor Beast refuses to leave his new friend behind. When he uses his blaster against one of the Iron Wolves, he sees it doesn't have an effect on them. One of the wolves wraps its jaws around Razor Beast's arm, and then he is quickly overwhelmed by them. Skull, seeing this happen, goes all out saying get off of him one by one she is taking out each iron wolf beginning to create a pile of bodies around her the very last wolf tries to escape but she grabs it and rips it in half watching from afar are the va tunrar isn't happy with the loss of their pack of iron wolves pakak and takani are surprised scold went against her faction's nature after taking out the iron wolves Scold reaches Razor Beast's body and sees he's heavily damaged. When Razor Beast goes into his stasis lock, we see her debating on what to do. She knows if she takes him to the dark side, the Predacons will see he's not one of them. And if that happens, Megatron will have him killed and Tarantulus will take his body for experiments. She then realizes there's only one option left. Later, we go to the Axelon. Rattrap informs Optimus Primal that Scold is outside their base. Primal and Dinobot go to meet her, and when Dinobot tries to speak with her, Scold refuses, saying he's nothing but a traitor. Primal says to speak with him then. Scold then presents him with Razor Beast's body and tells Primal that he was seriously injured while trying to save her from Iron Wolves. 
Primal is confused by this and asks Scold why a Predacon would show mercy to a Maximal. And Scold replies that she owes him her life and the Maximal's ship was closer and calls out Primal for assuming all the Predacons are the same. As Scold turns to leave, Dinobot points out to her that she hasn't stuttered or mumbled once since she appeared at the Axelon and tells her that she's good and may be in need of a better environment and even suggests that she just join the Maximals. Scold shoves Dinobot aside and this is where we get her hatred for the Maximals. She says that the Maximals are worse than the Predacons because they mask their cruelty behind a kind face, while Megatron and the other Predacons don't disguise who they are. At least, she always knows where she stands with them. She says, next time we meet, I won't be this nice. And as Scold walks away, Dinobot growling replies, next time will be sooner than you think. And that is the end of Pod Landing and Thicker Skin. Hey, what's up everyone? James here, and we are finally back covering IDW's Beast Wars. If you are new here or you need to catch up, the playlist to Beast Wars as always will be in the description box and in a pinned comment down below. So picking up where we last left off, Optimus Primal has gotten tired of playing defense, playing it safe. His initial plan after crash landing on the planet was to just hunker down, sit safely behind their shields and study the planet until they could send a transwar beacon back to their time. But that plan hasn't worked out well for them. Nynx got captured and tortured. Dinobot after joining them was nearly killed when the Predacons tried to take their ship. Black Arachnia penetrated their defenses and almost took control of the rest of the Maximal Protofarm pods. All this has made Optimus Primal realize it's time for them to strike back. They're going to get the Golden Disc. Raptrap makes it clear that he's against it because he believes they shouldn't put themselves at risk. However, Dinobot tells him that Megatron having the golden disc gives him a considerable advantage. He tells the story of how Cybertron discovered it and how Megatron came to know about it. He explains that it began with an Energon collector mining an asteroid. He came across a crash probe. This probe is the Voyager spacecraft that appeared on the Beast Wars show. In the wreckage of the probe, this collector found the golden disc. He brought it to the Wheeljack Science Ministry. Now it's cool to see another OG Autobot, like when we saw Ironhide at the story's beginning. Wheeljack and the other scientists discovered that the disc was ancient and was saturated with unspace energy. Before we go any further, I want to explain precisely what unspace energy is because it will be a big part of this series later. So Unspace has many names, Transwarp Space, Subspace, Bold Space, and more. It's a void of nothingness that lives outside standard space and time. It exists between the infinite dimensions, acting as a buffer of the Transformers multiverse. Some well-known Cybertronian technology uses the properties of Unspace, such as space bridges, which allow travelers and objects to travel space instantly, teleporting from one place to another. We saw this in the original Transformers show. The Maximals and Predacons ships use transwarp drives that uses unspace energy to time travel. Transformers use subspace storage pockets to store their personal weapons and items in unspace. For example, that's where Optimus' trailer goes every time he transforms out of his semi-mode. Transformers that can change their size, they put their mass or take it from unspace. Whether it's shrinking like Soundwave or Blaster when they transform into a cassette player, or enlarging like Astro Train who enlarges himself to transport a convoy of Decepticons. So to Wheeljack and the other scientists, the golden disc being covered in unspace energy was a clear indicator that it had traveled through time more than once. The Ministry managed to decode one of the files, and we don't find out what was revealed, but as Dinobot puts it, it was significant. But instead of sharing the discovery and the important findings with the people of Cybertron, they chose to downplay it and keep it to themselves. One of the scientists, however, disagreed with this decision and tried to get the Ministry to reverse that decision. And when they did not, he took matters into his own hands. He decided to turn to a Predacon who was making a name for himself. Galavar. He was looking for help in stealing the disc and was planning on not keeping it for himself but sharing it with the people. But as we know, Galavar, now Megatron, had his own plans. Dinobot tells the Maximals that just one of the disc files led them to this time and planet with a vast Energon cache. Who knows what other secrets it may contain. This is why they need to take the risk of retrieving it. Optimus then lays out all their objectives in the attack. The first is taking out the Darkseid's transwarp capabilities. 
The second is retrieving or destroying the golden disc. And the last objective is to do as much damage as possible to the Predacons equipment. If they're successful while the Predacons recover, they'll focus on retrieving the protoform pods and repairing the Axelon. Dinobot believes though they must do more, like kill as many Predacons as possible, which is definitely a Dinobot thing to say. However, Optimus disagrees and I like what he says here. He says because taking a life leaves scars. Rattrap asks how exactly they will make it there, and this is where Optimus reveals their new transportation, an escape pod they refitted into a shuttle. As they're heading to the Predacon ship in this shuttle, Razor Beast is unsure of this plan, because he doesn't think all the Predacons are bad, since remember in the last video, Skold saved him and they became friends. Now Optimus lays out everyone's part in this attack. Nynx and Rattrap are going to sneak into the ship. Once they're in the ship, Nynx will destroy the Predacons transwarp drive and Rattrap will go after the Golden Disc. The rest of the Maximals will draw the attention and battle the Predacons, distracting them until both their objectives are complete. Meanwhile at the dark side, Scorponok is whipping the Predacons into shape, taking them through some training, Pterosaur eventually gets tired of it, and he tells them all that he is tired of no action and tired of Megatron being only focused on the Golden Disc. He says it's time Megatron was replaced by a leader with vision. What Pterosaur doesn't know is Megatron is right behind him. Megatron challenges Pterosaur to prove himself and tries to take his head. Pterosaur pleads to Megatron that he didn't mean it and just meant to say they should destroy the Maximals. He tries to transform and fly away, but Megatron's jaws reach him. He smashes Pterosaur to the ground and explains to him that the Maximals are cowards and their time will come. Instead of wasting Energon trying to destroy them, he'd rather focus on the disc since it already has shown him fragments of the future. What Megatron is referring to is in the last video, he was able to decrypt one of the files on the disc that revealed a message that presumably was from a future version of himself. Megatron tries to execute Pterosaur, he unleashes a blast from his T-Rex head cannon. Surprisingly, Tarantula saved him, using his new portable air bubble device. He reminds Megatron that Pterosaur is still useful, so Megatron decides to spare him. What's funny here is Tarantula didn't save Pterosaur out of the goodness of his heart. He tells Pterosaur that if Megatron blasted him, there would have been no functional parts left of his body for his experiments. All I'll say is, this won't be the last time we'll see these two when it comes to experiments. For those of you who know the story, don't say anything, you know what I mean. As the Maximals approach the dark side, Primal tells Dinobot to land on the side of the mountain, but Dinobot reveals he modified the ship with some firepower, so he is coming in blasting, firing an array of rockets. Luckily for the Predacons, Waspinator hears the missiles coming and pushes the rest of the Predacons out of the way in time. But when they rise, standing over them is Optimus Primal, demanding to know where Megatron is. The Transformers will return after these messages. Hey James here, and I hope you're enjoying the video. If you'd like to be a big part of this channel's content and have behind the scenes access to the channel, go ahead and join my Patreon. I have two tiers, each with an array of benefits. The link will be in the description box and in the pinned comment down below. With that out of the way, let's get back to the video. We now return to the Transformers. In the dark side, Megatron's frustration is boiling over with his work on the golden disc proving fruitless. At that moment, the ship's AI informs him of the Maximals' attack. As he comes out of the ship roaring for the destruction of the Maximals, he is immediately blasted by an Energon Blast from Dinobot. Megatron is surprised to see that he still lives. Now Nynx and Rattrap do their job, try to sneak onto the ship, but Black Arachne appears, blocking their path. Until Cheetor comes charging in to take her on, wanting a rematch. Nyx and Rattrap successfully sneak into the dark side and split up. Nyx finds the transwarp drive room, but before she can attempt to destroy it, Tarantulus catches her off guard, trapping her with his portable bubble device. However, Nyx has some firepower this time, unlike the last time they met. She fires her wrist blaster and destroys his new device. As that fight is going on, Rattrap successfully finds the golden disc in Megatron's chamber, but before he takes it, he wants to verify that it is the real thing. Meanwhile, outside the dark side, the fight between the Maximals and Predacons rages on. Optimus Primal is battling Waspinator and he quickly takes him out. When Primal asks who's next, Skold steps in, saying me. 
Now, we know Scold is no slouch and is physically the strongest of the Predacons. She brings the fight to Optimus Primal. At the same time, Razor Beast and Pterosaur are fighting, and Razor Beast gains the upper hand and stuns Pterosaur. He then notices the fight between Primal and Skull. He steps between them and tries to tell Skull the Maximals aren't her enemies. He explains that even though they were the ones who attacked, no one was seriously hurt, only stunned, and the Maximals are fighting defensively, not offensively. This convinces Skull to stop fighting for the moment, and as he's about to reveal they only came for the stolen golden disc, he is suddenly grabbed by Pterosaur. Initially, Razor Beast believes Pterosaur will drop him out of the sky and is confident he'll survive. However, Pterosaur reveals that isn't his plan and informs Razor Beast about the floating islands with volatile Energon crystals. He drops Razor Beast right on top of them. Scold yells no, then an explosion occurs. And that's the end of Razor Beast. Back at the battle between Megatron and Dinobot, who are both fighting in their dino forms, Megatron notices Dinobot is favoring his right side, still not fully repaired from his near-fatal injury by Tarantulas. Megatron wraps his jaws around Dinobot's torso, crushing him. But Dinobot isn't going down easily. He stabs his Psycarbon blade into Megatron's side. Unfortunately, it doesn't slow down Megatron. He transforms and pulls the blade out and has it at Dinobot's throat. Luckily, Optimus Primal intervenes. Now as the battle between both groups is going on, Skold is hiding. The loss of Razor Beast traumatized her. She's afraid. Pterosaur approaches her. He demands she goes back out on the battlefield and fights before he does to her what he did to Razor Beast. Now saying that to Skold was a big mistake. She becomes enraged, tears open Pterosaur's chest, and rips out his spark. This was freaking badass. Scold is a beast. Standing over his sparkless body, she says, I always hated you. Back to the fight with Primal and Megatron. Primal is taking a beating. He's trying to buy more time for Nynx and Rattrap to achieve their objectives. Inside the dark side, Nynx successfully destroys the ship's transwarp drive. Tarantulas becomes furious and leaps toward her. Nyx uses her taser designed just for him and incapacitates Tarantulas, finally getting the payback for the torture she endured from him. Rattrap informs her over comms that he's trapped because Megatron's chamber went into lockdown after he took the golden disc. Outside the ship, the fight between the Maximals and Predacons goes back and forth. Rhinox tries to convince Skull that they don't have to fight, but she is just full of rage right now. She blames the Maximals for Razor Beef's death because in her eyes, if they didn't attack, he wouldn't have died. When it comes to Dinobot, he's still dealing with his injury. Waspinator tries to take advantage and attacks him, but let's be honest, even an injured Dinobot is more than enough to take on Waspinator. He blasts Waspinator with his optic beams and takes him out. Nyx radios to Optimus that she's going to need some brute force to help Rattrap get free. This is where Optimus now goes on the offensive by giving Megatron a sweet uppercut out of nowhere. He tells Megatron that he was letting him beat him down, pretending to be weak, and mentions a warrior from an alien race created this strategy long ago. The name of it is the rope -Dope. The alien Primal is referring to is the great Muhammad Ali, who made this strategy and used it against George Foreman in their heavyweight championship fight dubbed Rumble in the Jungle. As Megatron prepares to unleash an energy blast, Optimus leaps toward him and impales Megatron in the head with his dual blades, causing the explosion to backfire and blow his head off. Skold is continuing to beat down Rhinox. She yells at him to fight back, but Rhinox refuses. Now, there's a theory out there that Rhinox is secretly a Predacon spy. What he says next to Skold gives some credence to that theory. He says that Maximals and Predacons are more alike than they care to admit, and he reveals that he's befriended and even loved some Predacons in his life, that he would be devastated too if he saw any of them die. Skold stops her attacks and tells Rhinox to leave before she changes her mind. Back in the dark side, Optimus Primal helps Nynx get Rattrap free. As they try to escape, Megatron traps them in a force field. Initially, he believes he is victorious and relishes how he will tear them limb from limb after he is repaired. However, Primal crushes those dreams when he reminds Megatron he holds all the cards. All the golden ones to be exact. He threatens Megatron that he'll destroy the golden disc if he doesn't let them go. He tells Megatron he might think to use his transwarp drive to go back in time and steal it again, 
but he informs him his ship's transwarp drive is destroyed. Also, even if he manages to take over the Maximals Axelon, the self-destruct will trigger if he uses the transwarp drive without Primal. Megatron becomes filled with rage. Primal offers to give him the golden disc if he lets them go. Megatron begrudgingly accepts the deal. Once the Maximals are aboard their shuttle and on their way back to their ship, Rattrap reveals he made a copy of the Golden Disc. Also, Optimus reveals to the crew there is no self-destruct on the Axelon. He bluffed Megatron. After the Maximals leave, Megatron tells Tarantulas his spark is filled with rage. Now this moment is a moment of growth for Megatron. He explains he's angry with himself. He recognizes that he underestimated the Maximals, believed he could easily predict their movements, but was blinded by his ambitions and was haunted by his future. He decides deciphering the disc is no longer his top priority. He says, now more than anything else, I want to take Optimus Primal's head and see the light fade from his eyes. I will have this, so swears Megatron. Now from there we go to an epilogue. Remember what I said about experiments with Pterosaur and Tarantulas? We go to Tarantulas in his lab with Pterosaur's dead body on his table. He says, Pterosaur, I knew you would be the first to fall, but good news, there can be life beyond death. And that's the end of the Maximals Strike Back. What's up everyone, we are back with Transformers Beast Wars. And this issue focusing on Cheetor is awesome. So this opens during the Maximals attack on the Predacons that took place in the last video. So if you haven't seen that, link is going to be in the pinned comment down below. Now what happens here is during the battle, a stray energy blast hits an Energon crystal near Cheetor and an explosion occurs knocking him out. Now while knocked out, Cheetor remembers his life as a high level athlete on Cybertron. I'm like 99% sure we never learned this about Cheetor in the Beast Wars show, and this is the first time we're seeing it. Now suddenly he wakes up, luckily still in one piece, but he is back on Cybertron. Now he is confused and is not sure where he is. Catscan here, the Maximals physician, informs him that he's cleared all the remaining tests required to work on the Science Ministry's Axelon. Cheetor gets even more confused because this has already happened. He's basically having deja vu. Out of nowhere, Catscan asks Cheetor what is the Tivas maneuver. Remember this because he's going to be asked this again. Cheetor doesn't answer, he abruptly leaves. He wonders why Catscan asked him about the Tivas maneuver and questions if this is a dream he's living or if everything before he got knocked out was a dream. I'm sure most of you already know or have figured out what's happening here, but for the sake of the story, let's play along and act like we don't because Cheetor and us are going to see what's really going on here and the reveal is going to be crazy. He goes to McAdam's oil house, which I swear is like the only bar in all of Cybertron. We never see another one, I feel like. Now at the bar, a couple of fans approach Titor, and one of them makes fun of him for leaving his career as a racing champion to now enlisting to become a science officer. The other fan here agrees and then asks Cheetor, does Nynx know what the T-Voss maneuver is? Cheetor becomes suspicious and ends up leaving the bar. While on a rooftop nearby, he wonders how those two random fans knew about Nynx, since he didn't meet her until he boarded the Axelon, and knew about the T-Voss maneuver. He tries to use his onboard computer to run a diagnostic. When it doesn't respond, suddenly he is hit with a memory of the blast before he was knocked out. He ends up remembering everything now and believes this is a dream he is in. He surmises that he's most likely offline going through repair right now. As he is about to reconnect to his external sensors and try to awaken, he is interrupted by a shadow purple version of himself, who reveals himself to be Pacock, one of the Vok. He introduces himself to Cheetor and reveals that he's one of the stewards of the planet the Maximals and Predacons have been battling on. He explains how the Vok have been watching them, ruining experiments they've been working on for centuries. He also reveals to Cheetor that this isn't a dream and that he is one of the Vok, a race of beings made of pure energy, who can read the minds of technological beings easily. Basically what Pacock has done to Cheetor here is suppress his consciousness and created what you can call the Matrix essentially. And the reason why he's gone through all this effort of creating all this for Cheetor is because the Vok haven't been able to fully understand the Maximals protoform pods. But while he was probing Cheetor's mind for the answers to the protoform pods, he stumbled across something else he wanted to investigate, the T-Vaz maneuver. 
This is why everyone Cheetor has come across in this world has asked him about it. Now, Cheetor initially doesn't take this all seriously. He just brushes it off as still a dream. This pisses off Packock. Instead of secretly extracting information as he initially intended, he decides to take it by force now. He telekinetically grabs Cheetor. He threatens to erase his mind and eliminate his spark unless he tells him everything he wants to know. What happens next shows Cheetor isn't just some bot who only has athletic ability and can hold his own in a fight. He outsmarts Packock because once Packock sees that Cheetor is laughing as he is tossing him around, he stops and asks why. Cheetor reveals that he wanted Packock to show him that it wasn't a dream and wanted to learn his plan. That even if he does end up killing him, he still won't get the information he wants. He's in a lose-lose situation. The Transformers will return after these messages. Hey James here and I hope you're enjoying the video. If you'd like to be a big part of this channel's content and have behind the scenes access to the channel, go ahead and join my Patreon. I have two tiers, each with an array of benefits. The link will be in the description box and in the pinned comment down below. With that out of the way, let's get back to the video. We now return to the Transformers. Packock sees that subterfuge and violence aren't going to work on Cheetor, so he comes up with a plan. He speaks to the competitive athlete Cheetor used to be. He proposes a race. He tells Cheetor if he wins, he'll allow him to come back online. But if he loses, Cheetor must give him full access to his mind. Cheetor ends up agreeing. At that moment, Packock transforms into the fastest Cybertronian ever. Blur. Cheetor's favorite athlete. The race then begins, Cheetor versus Blur. I love the way their speed streaks are depicted here, I just love this entire thing. As Cheetor and Packhawk slash Blur are racing, Cheetor asks what is the course and where are they racing to? Cheetor is unaware that the city they are racing through is his own neural circuitry. I really like this reveal here. Back in the real world, Optimus Primal and Rhinox are in the Axelon's medical bay with Cheetor's unconscious body. Rhinox reports that Cheetor's body is fully repaired and his spark is strong, but his consciousness won't come back online. Optimus Primal yells at Cheetor's unconscious body to wake up. At that moment in his mind, Cheetor hears Primal's faint voice. He loses his concentration and Packock takes the lead. Once Cheetor sees this, he goes into his second gear, boosting his speed and ends up winning the race. However, even though he wins the race, Packock outsmarted Cheetor. The wager and the race were never real. This was all a ruse. Packock reveals to Cheetor the racetrack was a pathway through his own neural circuitry that gave him access to his memories. He tells Cheetor he knows now the T-Boz maneuver was just something from his athlete days. But the information he possessed on the protoform pods, that was very interesting. And he can't wait to experiment on them. Cheetor tries to stop him, but Pakak is a being made of energy. Physical attacks don't work on the Vok. Pakak keeps his end of the bargain and blasts Cheetor with a beam that ends up awakening him in the real world. Once he's back online, he begins to tell Primal about the Vok. But before he can give any more details, his system initiates a hard reboot. When Primal asks him about the Vok, Cheetor doesn't know what he's talking about. The reboot was initiated by Pakak, who was unseen by the Maximals and is laughing menacingly. He teleports away and the Vok have officially made their move. This is the beginning of the Transformers War against the Vok. The Vok War begins. Hey, what's up everyone? James here and we are back with Beast Wars. This is the beginning of the end of this series. So if you want to get caught up, check out the link right here or check out the pinned comment below. With that being said, let's get right into it. So it begins here with the Predacons, Scorponok and Waspinator being attacked by these creatures that are giving them some trouble. They add to the list of strange creatures we've seen in this series so far on this planet that we can safely assume are all experiments of the Vok. We had a spiky looking saber tooth back in issue four, a dragon headed croc in issue six, and iron wolves in issue 10. 
When it comes to these beasts though, they seem to be a mixture of the saber tooth tiger and a hammerhead shark. Now, Waspinator and Scorponok do eventually successfully defeat these creatures. Now, why these beasts were attacking them gets answered here. Scorponok points out that these creatures seem to be in a berserk-like state, and he bets what caused them to behave that way is this energon load that he and Waspinator discover that is super potent. So potent that he could feel it through the shielding of his beast mode. Later, aboard the dark side, they take a piece of that Energon Crystal to Tarantulus. After analyzing the Energon Crystal, Tarantulus reports to the Predacons that the crystal's radiation has a psychoactive effect that increases aggression and anger. If you're questioning like Scorponok and Waspinator are as to why they weren't affected by the crystal, there are a couple of theories that could explain it, but we'll talk about those later. However, Tarantulus does seem to know the answer to that question but he laughs and only tells them they should consider what that says about them. Megatron, pleased with this new discovery, already has sinister plans for it, like weaponizing it. A few days later, Optimus Primal and Dinobot are positioning new warning sensors outside the perimeter of the Axelon. While planting one of them, it unexpectedly lights up and alerts them. The Predacons, Tarantulus, and Black Arachnia ambush them. However, they make it clear that they aren't here to have a drawn out battle. Tarantulus outmaneuvers Dinobot who is in his beast mode and he places a bomb on his back. The spider Predacons quickly make their escape. When Primal tries to take the bomb off of Dinobot's back, it suddenly goes off and the explosion knocks him out. So I'm sure some of you have already figured out what's happening here. The bomb Tarantulus planted on Dinobot wasn't an actual bomb per se. It was the potent Energon Crystal weaponized into a flashbang of sorts. This gets confirmed for us quickly here, because aboard the Axelon, after Rhinox successfully brings Optimus Primal back online and reminds him of the attack, Primal just straight up punches Rhinox right in the face, yelling at him for not being there when they were attacked, and blames Dinobot for letting Tarantulas get the drop on him. After Primal storms off, Dinobot astutely deduces the bomb must have increased his aggression. Rhinox mentions the radiation from the bomb affected Primal's neural processor, similar to Energon poisoning. He does wonder though why Dinobot wasn't affected, and theorizes maybe being in his beast mode saved him. But Dinobot has a different theory. He thinks it's because he is well practiced at controlling his aggression. Now this could answer the question as to why Scorponok and Waspinator didn't get affected by the Energon Crystal, because maybe Predacons as a race learned to control their aggression early on. Or possibly another theory is that certain Transformers are born with an innate increased aggression, and that is what Tarantulas meant by that says something about them when speaking to Scorponok and Waspinator. Comment below what you all think about this. Now this whole situation and some things that have transpired so far originated in the Beast Wars episode called Guerrilla Warfare. Dinobot in the episode got not a bomb stuck on his back but a seed pod, meant to be a funny scene since his short raptor arms couldn't reach it. Primal ended up taking it off. They both got ambushed by Scorponok who shot Primal with a device he created called a Cyber Bee. That device was supposed to turn Optimus Primal into a coward, but since Scorponok, as Dinobot put it, is notoriously incompetent, it instead turned Primal into a berserker. One thing you guys may have noticed so far, I go back and forth between calling Optimus Primal or calling him Optimus or calling him Optimus Primal. I just like switching it up sometimes, get used to it. As Primal is storming the halls of the Axelon, Nynx greets him and Primal just slams her up against the wall and yells at her for getting captured by the Predacons when they first arrive. Cheetor and Rattrap try to intervene, and Primal calls them a bunch of losers and just throws Nynx towards them. He then straight up pimp slap Cheetor, tries to hit Rattrap, but luckily he dodges the attack. Rhinox comes up from behind and restrains Optimus. Now what Dinobot says next reveals how he truly feels about the Maximals. He talks Optimus down and reminds him his crew is loyal and admits they are as good and true as any warriors he's ever met. He also redirects Optimus Primal's fury towards Megatron. 
he tells him he could end him and receive a hero's welcome back on Cybertron. Optimus breaks out of Rhinox's grip, yelling how Dinobot is right, and rushes off to attack Megatron. Dinobot and Rhinox reveal to the rest of the Maximal crew this was their plan. Have Optimus be focused on Megatron while the radiation in him burns off. Now the hope is the radiation will burn off before he even reaches the dark side. And if it doesn't, Dinobot mentions a fight for the ages will take place. Now speaking of Megatron, on the dark side, he's trying to repair the ship's transwarp drive that the Maximals destroyed, but he's having a hard time. Waspinator informs him about a Maximal who's fallen into one of their traps. Megatron follows him into the forest, but he finds nothing. Megatron just walked into a trap. This isn't Waspinator. This fake Waspinator tries to blast him, but Megatron dodges and asks if he's a Maximal Assassin. Fake Waspinator answers no, I'm just the one that fooled you. He quickly gains the upper hand in the fight and incapacitates Megatron by blasting his head with electricity. This fake Waspinator transforms into his true form, a bot named Saberback, who reports to someone over comms saying, I have Megatron, that's one down. We then go to Optimus Primal in his beast mode swinging through the forest, heading toward the dark side. Suddenly though, he is blasted out of the tree line onto the ground. The bot who did this introduces himself. His name is Polar Claw. In his beast mode, which as his name suggests, is a polar bear. And I have to say, he has quickly become one of my favorite Beast Wars characters, because as a Transformer, he is no joke. He tells Primal to come with him, but to no surprise, Optimus refuses. They start bashing each other in their beast modes, going back and forth. Optimus takes the fight in his hands, beating down Polar Claw, believing he is a Predacon sent by Megatron to stop him. He makes it clear to Polar Claw he won't stop from reaching Megatron. However, Polar Claw reveals Megatron didn't send him. When Optimus asks who sent him, Polar Claw answers, there is more to this world and bigger threats than you Maximals and Predacons. As to who sent me, I was sent by gods. Polar Claw transforms and unleashes a blast that puts Optimus down for the count. Polar Claw reports to someone over comms saying Optimus Primal is ours. Some cycles later, we go to Optimus Primal waking up and finding himself in a cave with Megatron. He launches at him and ends up hitting a shield that electrocutes him. He threatens Megatron that if he has anything to do with their current situation, he'll rip him apart. Megatron enjoys Optimus Primal's fury and informs him that Tarantulus was the one responsible for the device that made him this way. As Optimus is about to let his anger take control again, it quickly dissipates. Optimus realizes the jolt from the force field helped clear the rest of the Energon radiation from his brain. He tells Megatron they should work together to get out of their current predicament, but to no surprise, Megatron refuses because he is content with sitting and waiting until the Predacons find him. Optimus points out though that whoever has them captured most likely has them well hidden and reminds him that this planet is big and both their crews won't find them anytime soon. Despite all of that, Megatron still refuses to work with him. Optimus hits the shield with his two cyber blades and Megatron informs him the shields are resistant to physical attacks and absorbs energy blasts. As they're both passing notes as to how they were captured, a voice interrupts, informing them that they are in a cavern deep within this world. That voice belongs to Tigatron, and with him are Air Razor, Saberback, Polar Claw, and Inferno. They are the children of the Vok. Okay, let's go into a little bit of a deep dive here on these characters, because some of them you're already familiar with, some of them you may not be. Now, let's go with Tigatron, Air Razor, and Inferno. They all three originated in the Beast Wars show. Tigatron and Air Razor both became Maximals and eventually became a couple. Inferno was a hilarious addition to the Predacons. He was always calling Megatron his queen or royalty and always yelling for the colony. Now, out of the three of them though, Air Razor and Tigatron have a connection with the Vok. 
They were abducted by them and the Vok merged their sparks and created Tiger Hawk. Now let me tell y'all something about Tiger Hawk. He was not one, but the most powerful transformer of the Beast Wars. Don't argue it, it is fact, I'm telling you right now. He had the power to manipulate the weather and the terrain of Earth with ease. And that was the only bot the Vok had created in the show. When it comes to Saberback, he originated in the Japanese Beast Wars spinoff called Beast Wars Neo. When it comes to Polar Claw, technically he first appeared in a Beast Wars 3H comic story where we briefly got a glimpse of him, but where we first saw him in all of his glory was IDW's Beast Wars The Gathering. Fun fact, both were written by Simon Furman. So if you're wondering how the Vok got their hands on the protoform pods, remember in issue 8 Black Arachnia had successfully infiltrated the Axelon and she had called down all 19 protoform pods. Then in the last video, Pakak gained access to Cheetor's mind and learned about the protoform pods. So the Vok took them, reprogrammed them, and brought the protoforms to life. Really it's 18 because Skull discovered Razor Beast's pod. Now you may be saying to yourself, James, you said 18, but there are only five Transformers here. Don't worry, the rest will appear, and it's going to be absolutely insane. Now, their connection to the Vok gets confirmed for us when Megatron asks them who they are affiliated with. Air Razor answers, they don't identify as Maximal or Predacon. They've had a spiritual awakening thanks to the Vok. Megatron becomes furious, asking who the Vok are and demanding to speak to them. Tigatron tells him he isn't worthy enough to speak to them, because they are the stewards and gods of this world. The children of the Vok all explain to Megatron and Optimus that the Vok demand they stop interfering with this world. Their only options are to leave the planet or go into stasis until the Vok are done with their experiments. To no surprise, Megatron refuses both options and blasts the shield and tells the children of the Vok they are nothing. Tigatron informs Megatron he'll pass along his request, but he bets he'll run out of power and cease to function long before the Vok ever considers speaking to him. After the Vok's Transformers leave, Megatron gets pissed at Optimus for not saying anything, but Optimus informs him he didn't say anything because he was focused on the shield. He explains that after Megatron blasted the shield, the dust around him dispersed and passed through it, and points out that the children of the Vok transformed into their beast modes to exit the cavern. Also, he points out when he was captured, he was in his beast mode, and he questions why the Vok would go through the effort of shifting him back into his primary mode if they plan to imprison him. Optimus deduces his beast mode should be able to pass through the shield. He transforms and successfully passes through it. He proposes a truce to Megatron, and tells them the Vok aren't letting them leave here so easily, so they need to work together. Megatron begrudgingly agrees. Now unbeknownst to them, the Vok, Pakak, Takani, and Tunrar are observing them. Now to help you all distinguish who's who out of the Vok, in their previous appearances we could only tell them apart by the differences of their heads and faces. Luckily here it's a lot more noticeable, and each of them has a set of different colored eyes. Tunrar has pink glowing eyes, Takani has green, and Pakak has yellow. The Vok are surprised to see Optimus and Megatron, the bitter rivals, working together. Takani is curious to see if they will turn on each other. He proposes they have their Transformers attack them. If Optimus and Megatron survive the onslaught, then they'll speak with them. Pakak and Tunrar agree to the proposal. Once Optimus and Megatron exit the cavern, they are surrounded and attacked by the children of the Vok. Now make no mistake, though they are outnumbered, Megatron and Optimus are able to hold their own against them. Megatron wraps his jaws around Polar Claw in his beast mode, and Optimus takes on Tigatron and Saberback. Whereas Optimus is still trying to get the children to agree to a peaceful coexistence, Megatron is like, nah son, it's kill or be killed. He lifts Polar Claw and unleashes a massive blast through Polar Claw's body, killing him right on the spot. Don't get me wrong, this was cool to see, but my problem with it is when we initially meet Polar Claw, he is depicted as a massive bot. He either could be Megatron size 
or you can argue he's even bigger. I don't believe Megatron would be able to fully wrap his jaws around him or even be able to lift him. He isn't as strong as Skold is. But anyways, Optimus Primal gains the upper hand in his fight with Tigatron, taking out his blaster, and Air Razor intervenes. What's more interesting than that is Megatron aims his blaster at Optimus, considering taking him out while he's distracted. But Megatron ends up not going through with it since he would be outnumbered 4 to 1 if he does that. At that moment, Saberback and Inferno try to sneak up on Megatron using Saberback's hologram ability to turn themselves invisible. However, Megatron is prepared for that. They both end up ensnared by his grip. He says to Saberback, it's best to never attack a Predacon and leave him alive. He absolutely crushes Saberback with his jaws and that's the end of him. Before he can do the same to Inferno, a voice interrupts, saying this fight is over. The voice is Pakak, using Polar Claw's body as a puppet to speak through. He admits that he wasn't going to intervene, but has grown attached to his Transformers. He explains to Megatron and Optimus that the Vok have been on this world for longer than they can imagine, running scientific experiments in order to increase the depths of their knowledge. But their Maximal and Predacon War has constantly interrupted those experiments. They've let them fight up until now because their conflict gave them interesting data and the crash protoforms allowed them to experiment. However, the Predacons messing with the super potent Energon load they've been experimenting on for many kilocycles was the breaking point. They want them to choose either to leave the planet or be put in stasis. Optimus Primal argues they didn't mean to come to this planet and have no way of leaving, and asks if there's a way they can coexist together. At that moment, Megatron fires his T-Rex cannon, destroying the Polar Claw puppet, while saying, I have no more patience for this. He then gloats to Tigatron about how his supposed god is dead now, but Megatron quickly learns Pakak isn't dead at all. Pakak says, I'm not dead, Megatron. I tried the neutral route, but now you will see us as we are. The Vox show their true forms. Pakak says to Megatron, in your words, I have no more patience for this. He brings Megatron to his knees, slowly destroying his spark, while spelling out for him while he and the rest of the Transformers cannot defeat them. He says, we are beings of pure energy we are more powerful than you can imagine. Suddenly Optimus pleads for Megatron's life, which surprises the Vok. They ask Optimus why would he defend an enemy. Optimus answers, killing someone on the battlefield is different compared to murdering someone, and admits even though Megatron murdered two of their own in self-defense, he should be tried for his crimes, not murdered. While Takani and Pakak are shocked by this new development, Tunrar doesn't care, he wants to destroy the Transformers and be done with the matter. Optimus uses this opportunity to play on Takani and Pakak's scientific curiosity. He suggests the Vok not pass up the opportunity to see what two opposing factions might do when both are faced with a greater threat. Takani and Pakak, excited at the prospect, agree to it, while Tunrar tries to advise against it. However, Pakak makes it clear to Optimus that this agreement won't save him, only buy him more time. Optimus asks the Vok that the time they are being given to prepare for the conflict goes undisturbed and uninterrupted, and to not spy on them, adding that it would be good for the experiment. Pakak agrees to the demands, and tells Optimus the Vok will keep their distance and give them 7 cycles to prepare. After that, then they will come for them. After the Vok leaves, Megatron is convinced they are doomed, because how do you defeat an opponent you cannot even touch and can bring you to your knees with just a thought? Despite that though, Optimus believes they still have a chance. That's the end of the video. The end of Transformers Beast Wars is here and it's incredible. What's up everyone, James here, and be sure to hit that like button if you're excited to see the end of the Beast Wars. If you are new here and need to catch up, the link to the playlist of this series will be in a pinned comment below. 
Now, we pick up with Optimus Primal and Megatron, informing both of their crews they have to team up and battle the Vox. To no surprise, both crews aren't happy about it, and are against the idea. Some of the Maximals aren't comfortable with it because of all the misery the Predacons have caused up until now, or others believe it's just an opportunity for the Predacons to get in close and betray them. Optimus tells them personal feelings don't matter now because this is life and death. When it comes to the Predacons, Megatron explains just how powerful the Vok are, that with just a thought they nearly killed him. Despite that though, the crew is still against working with the Maximals. Black Arachnia tries to argue they should focus on the crash protoform pods and try to build an army, but as Scorponok points out, they don't have enough time. When it comes to those crash protoform pods, they aren't around anymore. All I'll say is, the Vok have more in store for the Transformers. Megatron yells at them saying that there aren't any other options and orders the Predacons to work with the Maximals. Later, both groups meet up, and there's already an air of tension between them. What Optimus and Megatron plan on doing is exchanging their forces. Both groups have different tasks to work on to help with the upcoming battle with the Vop. Rhinox and Dinobot will work with the Predacons. Scold, Black Arachnia, and Waspinator will work with the Maximals. On the Axelon, since the Maximals have more weapons than the Predacons, they will be working on adapting their ship's weapons to destroy the Vok and work on getting their ship off the ground. One interesting and yet funny thing we find out is Waspinator mentions that he has two Astro Mechanics degrees and he'll be helping Rattrap with the ship. I like this because, as we know, Waspinator on the Beast Wars show was always depicted as the expendable idiot of the Predacons. But in this series, Eric Burnham has been doing more than that with his character. On the dark side, they'll be working on new ways to attack and disrupt the Vok. Both Optimus and Megatron make it clear to both their crews that in seven cycles, war is coming. And they're not going down without a fight. They need to get to work and no ideas are off the table. Three cycles later, Rhinox and Scorponok are working on the Dark Side's Transwarp Drive. Remember, Nyx damaged it back when the Maximals attacked. Though the Predacons repaired it the best they could, Rhinox deduces that it will never transwarp a ship through Unspace again, but they could repurpose it to transwarp a data packet, which is essentially sending a message through Unspace. He explains to Scorponok he's theorized sending a data packet back to Cybertron with the Axelon's Transwarp Drive. But since transwarp drives aren't designed for that, it would risk destroying the drive. So that's why he never went through with it. However, Scorponok points out that since the Predacons transwarp drive is already almost worthless, they can take the risk and test sending a data packet with theirs. When Rhinox mentions that access to the drive has been secured, Scorponok investigates and is confused by why the data pad is showing the drive was recently locked. Remember that, because it's going to come up again. Luckily though, he is one of Iacon's top code breakers, at least he says so, we never get confirmation if that's the case, so he begins working on breaking through the secured lock. On the Axelon, Scold and Nynx are also working on disrupting the Vox energy. If you're a Scold fan like me, this is going to be one of your favorite parts with her character. Scold initially thinks it's a lost cause, and so Nynx asks the question, how do you defeat an energy monster? This makes Scold point out that they need to know what type of energy they are disrupting. When she remembers that Optimus and Megatron mention that the Vok are scientists who can disappear at will, that moment she realizes they must be using unspace energy to hide and watch over everything. This is why in the Maximal Strike Back video I explained what unspace energy is, because that's how the Vok have been able to operate this entire time. I really love that Scold was the one to figure this out, because she's just viewed as muscle and not intelligent by her fellow Predacons. But they're unaware there's more to her than meets the eye. Yeah, I said it. I had to say it at least once in this series. Anyways, Scold has the Dark Side's AI scan the ship for unspace energy readings, and the AI confirms the ship is covered in them. Later, Scorponok successfully breaks through the transwarp drive lock and reports over comps to Megatron that it was locked with his authorization code. Megatron quickly deduces that Tarantulus is the one responsible for this. He orders him to explain, but Tarantulus initially tries to pass the blame onto Dinobot, but Megatron doesn't buy it and demands to know why he did it. Suddenly though, Tarantulus fires at him and begins his escape. 
As Megatron is chasing him down, Tarantulas reveals the Vok approached him and offered him a place underneath their rule and the secrets of the universe. Just when Tarantulas thinks that he successfully escaped the ship and Megatron's wrath, out of nowhere, Dinobot leaps in and impales Tarantulas with his Psycarbon blade. This was awesome. And Dinobot is kind of paying Tarantulas back for stabbing him in the back during the Savage Landing arc. Now Tarantulas being a secret agent for the Vok and betraying Megatron is similar to the Beast Wars episode The Agenda, where it was revealed Tarantulas was part of the Predacon secret police and helped Ravage capture Megatron. Later, Megatron has Tarantulas strung up interrogating him, demanding to learn everything he knows about the Vok before he kills him. What's funny here is Tarantulas asks Megatron, don't you mean to say tell me everything you know or I'll kill you? Megatron answers, no, I do not. Tarantulas tries to offer him a deal to let him go and then he'll tell him everything he knows about the Vok. Megatron says, I am no fool, Tarantulas. Tarantulas replies, I don't know why you would expect undying loyalty from a group of insurgents. Which is funny and so true about both present and past Megatron. Both of them have experienced betrayal by their own soldiers. Tarantulas distracts Megatron long enough to activate his latest experiment, which is basically a zombie pterosaur who comes bursting through the interrogation room. I hope you guys didn't forget about him. Now, this reanimated pterosaur is 10 times more powerful than a live pterosaur. He smacks Dinobot and blasts Megatron. Though Rhinox is able to land a hit, Pterosaur quickly responds giving Rhinox a boot to the face and blasting him unconscious. After Tarantulas is released from the rack, he kicks Megatron's unconscious body and starts to gloat about how he will hand him and the rest of the Transformers over to the Vok. However, he quickly realizes Scorponok is missing out of the group. Luckily though, he was still able to get his message to the Axelon. He tells Tarantulas he's too late, that he's already warned the others. He fires a full power blast at Tarantulas, but Pterosaur deflects it. He made a big mistake. Tarantulas says, I was going to stun you and present you to the Vok with the others, but instead, I'm going to let Pterosaur feast on you. He's dead, but he still needs Energon to function, so why not let him consume yours? And that's the end of Scorponok. Pterosaur is tearing him apart as Tarantulas investigates the ship's computers. He confirms that Scorponok wasn't bluffing, he was able to send a data packet through Unspace. He reveals that the Vok ordered him to destroy what was left of the Darkseid's transwarp drive, but he is hesitant to do it since the only other ship is the Maximals, which is currently occupied, and he isn't 100% sure that it's transwarp capable at the moment. So in order to guarantee he'll obtain a working, transwarp capable ship to get himself off-world, he sends a data packet to Cybertron. Back on the Axelon, Skuld and Nynx are explaining to Optimus their theory on the Vok, not only them being powered by Unspace, but possibly the Vok coming from it. Cheetor interrupts, informing them about Scorponok's message about an attack on the dark side. Now this is where the story gets even crazier. Some cycles later, Rhinox reboots and awakens to Dinobot defending his body. He is shocked at the sight of all-out war. All of the children of the Vok have been unleashed. The scene of this is incredible. The Vok found and brought to life every single one of the crashed protoform pods. Now, you may notice Polar Claw and Saberback are among the Transformers fighting here. It goes unexplained as to how they were revived. One thing I should mention that I thought was pretty cool is most of the children of the Vok are Beast Wars characters that appeared in the IDW Beast Wars miniseries, Beast Wars The Gathering and The Ascending. Both series take place after the events of the show. If you all want me to cover those series at some point, comment below. We do get a quick two second explanation as to how this transpired. Dinobot explains to Rhinox that Tarantulas informed the Vok of everything that happened and asked for reinforcements. He says, now you know the situation, now go and defend yourself. Dinobot charges onto the battlefield. Meanwhile on the battlefield, Optimus and Tigatron are facing off. Optimus is still trying to get Tigatron to see reason. Megatron is facing off against Armadillo and Snarl. 
Cheetor and Black Arachne are fighting side by side against Insecticon and Razorclaw. As that madness is going on, at the Axelon, Waspinator and Rattrap, working together, have managed to successfully get the ship's engines and weapons back online. Waspinator asks Rattrap though about the modifications he's still making to the ship's weapons. Rattrap explains that between Scorponok's message and the information he scanned off the Golden Disk, he's learned that the Vok don't like Unspace Energy. Now this is Eric Burnham playing it fast and loose here in order to explain how Rattrap knows this about the Vok, because Scorponok's message was just about the attack on the dark side. And remember, Megatron was never able to decode the disk, so even when Rattrap made a copy of it, he would still need to decode it in order to gain its secrets. Rattrap warns Waspinator when they fire on the Vok, they're either going to blast themselves to a new reality, or the ship will blow up. Either way, the Vok are going to get blasted. Back on the battlefield, Scold is kicking butt and taking names, until suddenly she is blasted by a beam that paralyzes her. That blast came from the undead pterosaur. As he's about to feast on her, out of nowhere, Rhinox in his beast mode rams him off of Scold. Rhinox tells Scold, since she is still conscious from that blast, she should be able to reset and be mobile again, and to leave pterosaur to him. I love this moment because Rhinox is like, I want a round two pterosaur. He says to him, I prefer not to engage in violence, but you and I have a score to settle. And since your spark is gone, I don't have to worry about holding back. He bashes pterosaur with his blaster that has moon stars attached to it. This was awesome. Returning to Optimus and Tigatron's battle, this conversation they have shows us that this Tigatron and Beast Wars show Tigatron both seek the same life. Tigatron tells Optimus that he and his fellow brethren are not only metal but flesh as well, and should live in the wild on this world peacefully. But Optimus argues that will happen until the Vok decide their existence compromises one of their precious experiments. As Tarantulus is enjoying the chaos on the battlefield, Black Arachnia catches him off guard and knocks him down. Tarantulus lets it slip that he sent a message to Cybertron, and once a ship arrives, he'll return to Cybertron and rule with the knowledge the Vok has given him. When Black Arachnia calls him crazy, the Vok interrupts, and Tarantulus uses the distraction to strike her and escape. The Vok speak to all the Transformers on the battlefield, and announce they've shown up earlier than expected, because this battle has forced them to make a decision. They've decided that Cybertronians are too disruptive and unpredictable, so they will wipe this planet clean and start from scratch. They will even wipe out their own Transformers. Tigatron argues that they've done everything they've asked of them and asks why would they destroy them too. Megatron answers because the Vok are cowards. He tells the Vok to fight them on equal terms. To no surprise, they refuse and begin to incapacitate all the Transformers with their power. Takani then activates this device they call the Reversion Device that's secretly been concealed in one of the planet's floating islands. He mentions that it's slightly damaged because this is actually the same floating island that Razor Beast died on. What's amusing is that Tunra mentions they should have put the device in one of the planet's moons and Takani responds saying every world they come to he always wants to do that but it's impractical. He also says I'm sure in some universe it's been done before. What they're referring to is in the Beast Wars show, in the episode Other Voices, the Vok revealed their super weapon called the Planet Buster, basically their own type of Death Star. They were trying to use their super weapon to destroy the planet in the episode. Before the Vok activate their weapon, suddenly Pakak gets blasted and destroyed. Shocked at the sight of this, Tunra says that Pakak's energy has become one with Unspace. Rattrap and Waspinator on the Exelon have arrived, and the modifications work. They then take out Tunrar and Takani, completely wiping out the Vok for good. After the battle, Optimus Primal approaches Tigatron and offers a truce, but Tigatron responds with kind of a truce of his own, basically saying, leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. As some of the children of the Vok leave, Megatron makes his move. He leaves to attack Optimus. At that moment though, he gets blasted with unspace energy. When Optimus asks Rattrap what did he do to Megatron, Rattrap explains, or really theorizes, that since Megatron isn't an energy monster, 
he'll probably reappear in a few cycles in the future. Maybe. Optimus offers the rest of the Predacons an extension to their truce. He tells them that they should work together to find Megatron and then return to Cybertron together. Even though all of them besides Black Arachnia might be wanted by the Justice Department, his word on their good behavior could lead to a lenient verdict. Black Arachnia responds they would be fools to return and face trial. Dinobot agrees because he is also wanted, and though he believes Optimus is an honorable warrior, he points out that his recommendation won't go far if he doesn't return with Megatron because the Justice Department needs a scapegoat. Optimus tries to convince the Predacons to help them capture Megatron and return willingly to face the courts. Black Arachnia speaks for the Predacons and declines the offer, and tells the Maximals to leave. After the Maximals leave, Skold asks Black Arachnia what they will do about Megatron. Black Arachnia answers they'll worry about him if he ever comes back. Right now, she wants to find Tarantulas and kill him, and then try to repair the dark side and leave the planet. Who surprisingly approaches them is Inferno, pledging his loyalty to Black Arachnia. She accepts, and Inferno officially becomes a Predacon. When Skold and Waspainer ask how they supposed to repair the dark side, especially when parts are hard to come by, Black Arachnia directs their attention to the Vox reversion device, and answers, parts I wouldn't worry about, I'm sure there's something we can use from there. We then go to an epilogue here, a hundred and fourteen cycles later. Megatron reappears in a cave, and after his onboard system informs him that he's covered in unspace energy and still on the same planet, he quickly deduces he was sent through time, and gloats how the Vok, the biggest threat to his power in this world, is dead. He then mentions he'll overwrite his message on the golden disc to preserve the timeline. The series ends with Megatron saying, The Beast Wars will not end until I have won no matter what fate throws at me. That's where the final issue ends, but it's not the end of the video just yet. See, at the end of the final issue, Eric Burnham wrote a letter to all the fans of the series, explaining why the story ended prematurely. As we already know, it's because IDW lost the Transformers license, but he also went on to explain storylines and characters they wanted to do and see in this series. So let's go over some of those things he mentions in this letter, and others I've noticed throughout this series. First, there was going to be an issue where Rattrap's love of the planet's fruit was going to cause a glitch in his system just when his expertise was needed most, and the Maximals were going to be in a rush to save him. Second, Quick Strike from the Beast Wars show was going to make his appearance in this series, and he and Scorponok would become rivals, with him trying to replace Scorponok within the Predacons. Thirdly, Black Arachnia would take over the Predacons for a while, which as we saw became the case at the end of this series. Fourth, Waspinator would leave the Predacons and join the Children of the Vok and leave fighting behind. Fifth, Eric Burnham wanted to introduce some fusers. Now if you don't know what a fuser is, it's a Transformer whose alt mode is a fusion of two or more beasts. That's what Quick Strike is, and another character from the Beast Wars show who is a fuser as well is Silverbolt who sadly never made an appearance in this series. 6. Help would arrive for the Maximals and Predacons in their final battle with the Vok, in the form of the Maximal Elders and Tripedicus Council, who would help them as combiners. That would have been amazing to see. These are both groups we haven't seen much of, more so with the Maximal Elders, but god I would have loved to have seen that. 7th, as some of you suspected, Rhinox was going to be suspected to be a Predacon mole because remember back during the Savage Landing arc in issue 4, the Maximals discovered that someone had used the Axelon systems to beam a secret message to the Predacons before leaving Cybertron. Lastly, and this one is my absolute favorite one, Eric Burnham mentions he was going to fight Tooth and Nail to get the original Dinobots. All of them, or at least Grimlock, to appear in the series. Now, we did see an image of Grimlock back in issue 6, where we learned the Dinobots disappeared at some point during the Great War. Now, a few plot points that I noticed that we could have seen more of that Eric Burnham didn't mention is at the end of the final issue, a puddle in the cave shows the reflection of a buried protoform pod with a large X on its hull. 
This is Protoform X, aka Rampage would have made it his appearance in this series. He popped up in the Beast Wars episode Bad Spark, a big Predacon who is a serial killer and a cannibal with an immortal spark. Another is in issue 7 Megatron discovered a hidden message on the golden disc, apparently sent by his future self to warn of something of the future. It seemed like this was going to build up to a crazy event. Finally, was this planet the Transformers were on, we never found out whether it is a prehistoric Earth like in the Beast Wars show, or was it just a random planet the Vok experimented on? Now there's evidence to argue for both, because all throughout this series we've seen different genetically modified creatures, floating islands, large loads of Energon, but back in issue 1 there were dinosaur fossils buried in its crust. I guess we'll never know the answer. It took a long time to finish this series, but this is finally the end of our journey through IDW's Transformers Beast Wars. I hope you all enjoyed this video and the journey. Hit that like button, comment below your thoughts, and overall how you felt about this series. Other than that, have an awesome day, and always remember, every day, to maximize and go beyond.